I'm going to call the meeting to order. I've had a lot of requests because people apparently have planes they need to meet. Of course, we're not going to let that compromise our discussion. Um, today is Thursday or Friday, uh, August 11th. I want to ask all of us to please turn our cell phones to silent and make sure they're off the table so we can avoid feedback noise. You may no notice board members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They're using their laptops solely to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Dental Board of California, and the board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. Depending on the number of people who would like to testify on a particular item, a time limit may be imposed. We ask all speakers to please stay on topic and if a time limit is determined to be necessary, keep your comments within that time limit. And with that, I would like to call the meeting to order and please ask uh, our secretary to call the roll. Yes. Burton. Here. Chan. Here. Forsythe. Here. King. Here. Lai. Here. Lay. Here. Medina. Here. Morrow. I am here. Stewart. Witcher. Here. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thank you. So we'll move ahead with our first item of business for the day, the Executive Officer's Report. Good morning, everybody. My name is Karen Fisher, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Dental Board of California. My Executive Officer Report is in writing and is in your board packet. You can see by our personnel update that we've had a significant movement hiring um, some new people. I can, I'm happy to say that the training for them is going well. We have some, hired some very enthusiastic people. Um, <coughs> so we're very excited about what the future will hold in terms of uh, the board staff's ability to respond to telephone calls and emails more quickly and to be more responsive to consumers and stakeholders and licensees. Um, I won't go through each unit. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Um, we are uh, having um, some vacancies in our complaint and compliance unit, and that's the unit that first gets its hands on uh, the complaints as we get them. So we're trying to figure out, Carlos is working with our managers to ensure that we, are, we don't have a lot of backlogs in the interim while we're hiring people and that we can keep the process moving. Uh, I am happy to report that we're almost at full capacity for our enforcement units, the Swarns. Uh, we did have a special investigator leave our southern office, so we'll be advertising for a position there. And Ryan <coughs> Blunyan um, was a sworn um, investigator in our Sacramento office. He was recently promoted to our supervising investigator in the Sacramento office. And Ryan, if you would stand up and give a wave there. Um, we're excited about this because um, we're pulling him in to a lot of the administrative things to be able to help Carlos out. And I think that the team is getting even stronger. So we're very hopeful for the future. Uh, the next item on, the, uh, on my report is regarding the required tr uh, board member training. So the sexual harassment prevention training is offered online. Uh, this is a huge improvement over the way it's been offered in the past, where you had to sign up usually during work hours for two hours and get on a webinar or do something like this. So uh, we're fortunate that they do offer this training now to be taken at your leisure, through your own computer, on your own time schedules. The Department of Consumer Affairs has declared that uh, odd number years are mandatory reporting years for sexual harassment prevention training. So since this is 17, we're hoping that all board members will get that done. Uh, staff members are also required to get it done. We're hoping to have 100% compliance uh, anytime soon. So staff is going to be monitoring that. Uh, you'll be receiving a little note from Jerry if she hasn't gotten your certificate of completion. And so she'll be nudging you to get that out of the way. Uh, submit all these documents to Jerry. 
Uh, she's going to be um, tracking it, and she's the one that you can also call with any questions. Um, I put a link to the sexual harassment uh, prevention training in my report, but also if you have any trouble accessing that, go ahead and call Jerry. There are two, uh, what are we calling them, policy statements that we would like to collect today if you haven't already sent them in. I had sent out the policies for you, hopefully to read before you came today. So if you wouldn't mind, if you uh, would check with Jerry, she has brought blank copies for you to sign. We'll just get that out of the way right away. Essentially, those are just acknowledgments we have to collect from each of you. There are two of them. And so if you'll, you're willing to sign the documents, we'll mark that off the list today. Also, I think Jerry's been trying to track you all down. The department has uh, switched accounting programs, and that's, that's a very broad mm. way of explaining it. Uh, the July 1st, they switched over to a new way of budgeting and tracking, and uh, we may see a different look of our actually expenditures and budgets reports coming in the future since they switched over to a different program. But this re program requires board members to fill out this standard 204 uh, uh, form, and I just want to encourage you to make sure Jerry has that from you before you leave today, because they will not pay your travel expense claims unless this new form is submitted. So please make sure to check with her today. Also, as you're checking out, if you would like to give her your hotel bill, remember that ask the hotel to make sure you have a zero balance. And you can just leave that with Jerry now. If you have any additional receipts or whatever, you can send them to her as quickly as possible. And she will process your travel claim as quickly as possible. Number C, can, I, can uh -huh. I ask you a question on that one? Oh. So this 204 form, would they have possibly sent it to us in email? I, I got one of those emails that look like you better not open it because it's oh, probably. Oh, I sent it, actually. OK, you sent it. I sent it, okay. yeah. I sent it out. Uh, it's, it's a quick form to fill out. And as I said, Jerry brought uh, blank ones. So if you need one right now, if you do you need one right now, Kathleen? She'll just drop it off, and then you can fill it out. If any other board members need it right now, let Jerry know. Just raise your hand, and she'll come by, and you can fill it out quickly. And we can mark that off the list. If there are no questions on that, we'll go to C, which is the update from the June 30th, 2017 meeting with the Universidad de la Salle Bajo of Dentistry in um, Mexico. So. Uh, Dr. Witcher had mentioned this in his opening remarks yesterday that De La Salle had contacted us and wanted to have a meet and greet with their new dean. Uh, so uh, the dean and his assistant came to Sacramento and met with Dr. Morrow and Dr. Witcher and myself. They gave a presentation of the school and uh, they were very excited to report that they've been undergoing the CODA process for the last three years. They are having a... Um, a site visit this fall is scheduled, and they're hoping to know by this time next year whether or not they've been improved. And so this is, uh, this is really exciting for the school. Uh, they were also very conscientious about wanting to know what the renewal process was in the event that they didn't receive CODA approval. And so we walked through that process. If, if this school gets CODA approval, they are no longer essentially required to uh, get additional board approval because the board accepts code approved uh, schools. Can I, can I, yes. Can I, can I ask yes. On this well, uh, yes. <laughs> My understanding is that uh, the University of De La Salle is the very first school that has, foreign school that has reached this point in CODA's uh, foreign school accreditation process. And I've also had uh, information from CODA that there are a number of uh, individuals from foreign dental schools that have requested to observe, be a silent observer in the accreditation process in schools here in the United States to help them uh, get acquainted with that process. So there's an expectation that once the first school gets accredited by CODA, that there's going to be multiple applications for that process. Well, uh, De La Salle came before the dental board um, a number of years ago and, and received their second approval, I think, in 2012. So every seven years, they need to renew. So 
not taking, not taking for granted or putting anything to chance, they are going to be simultaneously preparing our renewal packet while they're continuing to go through the CODA process. Essentially, the board will need to reapprove them if they don't receive their CODA uh, by, May of by May of 2019, I'm sorry. So they've started the process. They want to try to get that information to the board as soon as possible so that it can be a re reviewed and they can um, make sure that they're in compliance and their school has continued to be accepted uh, as a pathway for licensure in California. Are there any questions about that? The um, approval for, by the board for the international schools was about 20 years ago. And the and legislative intent was that there was a perceived disparity in having Spanish-speaking dentists treating that part of the population. So the first thing on that is that at that time, uh, CODA wasn't able to do any kind of review of internationals. They didn't have the uh, process in place. Now that it does, the question is twofold. Number one, because now that process is a uh, probably a, a more proven process with d different um, um, safeguards in place, is is our intent downstream, well, let me let me rephrase this. Does it take a legislative um, statute to sunset our current process of the board um, approving these schools and allowing it to go through CODA? So that's the first question. The second question is, it, I believe that once they have the educational equivalent approved by the board, then they're eligible to take the national boards, they're eligible to take the REBS, I believe. But um, the question is, they appear to be restricted to the licensure in California mm -hmm. because other states require it a CODA. So the next part of the question is, if these schools decide to or if the statutes limit them to go to CODA, because now they can do the international accreditation in there, um, then the pathway is even broader. So it comes back to the first question. Do we look at sunsetting the approval by our board and allowing the pathway to go through CODA? This has been an issue that has been discussed by the board for the past two sunset reviews. And I can just report what past boards have wanted to do. And essentially, in short, it's to get out of the business of approving schools. Um, it would be up to this board to decide how to proceed. But this is clearly going to be an issue that we will need to be addressing in our sunset review, because it's, it continues to be one of the questions that the legislature brings. So yes, any changes that occur would need to be done statutorily and then followed up with any kind of regulatory clarification. I, I can foresee that um, if a statutory change is made, it would have to be, uh, it probably wouldn't be all CODA because we have a school we have a school that's currently provision, provisionally approved. If that, provi if that provisional approval gets full approval, we would still have to have the authority to re-review that school for board approval, I believe. But that's a discussion that the board will need to have and will need to get background information. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So moving Once forward, we would get out of the business of approving schools, but if we have schools that didn't go the CODA route that are already approved, we'll have to figure out how to uh, maintain the authority over those schools. Huh. But uh, it, And that's just off the cuff yeah. right now. But I'd, I would say stay tuned for more detailed discussion on this, because past boards have believed that um, CODA now does have international school review. And the, the comments in the past have been made, but no, no foreign schools have been able to pass muster, so to speak. So if De La Salle is able to do this, this is huge. 
this is huge. I'll have to wait for uh, comments downstream because there are too many pieces with Moldavia. Whether or not um, the question is, should we encourage Moldavia to pursue that pathway so that we get out of the business? Yeah, it's, um, it will be discussed at a future board meeting, certainly. Um, I want to recognize Missy Johnson. She is actually here as the representative from De La Salle. Did you want to just come up and make a comment? Missy, I'm sorry, was also in attendance at the meeting. I neglected to say she, she was there representing De La Salle. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, Ms. Fisher's um, report on our meeting is 100% accurate. Thank you for that. De La Salle is very excited to be um, in the middle of the CODA process. They are very much looking forward to the site visit in November and crossing their fingers and hoping very uh, steadfastly that the approval, they get the information in the spring that they have been CODA approved. Um, but as Ms. Fisher said, they aren't taking anything for granted, and they're operating on a parallel track so that they can maintain their their dental board approval as well so but right now everything looks like it's going very very well they're very excited um, and they are just uh, hoping everything goes well in November thank you so if there are no further questions about that item we'll go on to D which is the update regarding the implementation of AB 2331 chapter 572 this is relating to the ADEX exam so I've, I've periodically we get questions about where we are in the process, and ADEX um, has been aware from the beginning this is this was going to be a lengthy process, and what we needed to do essentially to uh, not only evaluate their exam but then develop regulations, and so they anticipated it would be a lengthy process, and we've been working we continue to work closely with their representatives on this issue. So what. What the mini plan is at this point is that uh, soon we are starting the dentistry occupational uh, analysis. OPES is undertaking that. They hope to have that complete within the year. And then from that, then they go and they look at the ADEX exam and do their psychometric review and their linkage studies. So then that's another year. During that time, we can probably start to look at regulations because the statute does essentially give the board the authority to determine what method of ADEX exam it will accept. So where the exam uh, is given, I'll say in the traditional way, uh, there was there may be an option to uh, for the board to require that we would accept candidates who have only taken the, their portfolio, portfolio model. And I'm switching my terms here, but uh, that came up in the discussion when ADEX was before the board, and the board seemed to want to emphasize that they wanted to see more of a portfolio model moving throughout the country as the standard type of exam. So uh, staff will periodically be giving the board updates on where we are in this, but OPES is starting to do the dental occupational analysis, and as I said, we'll report back as we get through each of these milestones that we have to go through. Uh, are there any questions or comments about this particular one? I have a question. <clears throat> uh, once, the, once the final stamp of approval has been placed on accepting the ADEX exam uh, for licensure, if, and, and this is supposition because you don't know for sure yet, but if the standard ADEX examination is considered acceptable for California. Will those individuals that have taken the ADEX exam 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago be eligible or only those that have taken it subsequent to our approval of the examination? Um, subsequent to the approval of the examination. And as I mentioned, it's likely that the board will put in regulation that the mo only model they would accept would be a portfolio model which didn't exist prior to their Buffalo study of a couple of years ago. But I believe they themselves wrote into the statute that their exam is only good for a year. And they, they tell the states that the ADEX exam essentially is only good for a year. 
So uh, that that's that's a interesting safeguard that actually has put in, I believe, on the board's behalf, so that people can't be going way back to say, well, I took this exam a long time ago. Now, we do, as Dr. Morrow has said on a number of occasions, essentially already accept the regional organizations who have given the ADEX exam in the past, because licensure by credential people who have been practicing in states on the East Coast, um, those candidates probably, or those licensees probably had taken an ADEX version of the exam. And so by the back door, the board has essentially accepted them because of their work experience. They've been working as a dentist for so many hours over the uh, five years, the previous five years. So um, we'll be continuing to report on this. I know that Dr. Lay actually, um, did you have any comments? You went to an ADEX exam, observed one? Um, I'm actually going to the meeting this weekend. Okay. Yeah. So I did go to USC CDCA exam in back in March to observe the exam for a day and a half. Um, do you want me just to kind of talk about that a little bit now too, or to see? Do okay. You, do you have so, any concerns? Or? Yeah. Um, so I attended the calibration of the examiners. Um, you know, when I was there. And the um, and the calibration appears to be, you know, um, the same um, as what I've seen at the Western Regional e Exam. Um, I observed um, how they graded the endo portion and also the PROS portion. I, ex I observed the grading um, of the live patient section only for just about an hour. Uh, then I had to leave. Um, it appears to me that it's very much the same, you know, as the rep exam that I've that I've been participating. Uh, of course, you know, we still need to wait, you know, for the uh, psychometric analysis uh, to come back. Um, but my feeling and my observation of the exam was is was that it was very much you know, the same. <coughs> I think it's interesting to, to report that apparently the old NERB regional testing is coming to California and some schools are administering that exam. I'm assuming for students who are going to be leaving California, going to be going to other states. Yeah. Um, at that particular exam, I believe there were 21 candidates. There were some that had been practicing here for some time, but they're now moving to states where only CDCA is accepted. So that's why they came to check the exam. There were some repeats from previous CDCA exam. Um, these, again, these are the students that are planning to move out of California, and they did not take the rep. They took the CDCA because of the states where they would be practicing. Um, and there were some students from USC there were a couple from Loma Linda, um, and then I believe there were two practicing dentists um, that were there. So um, I believe the total was like 21 candidates altogether. So Karen, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So if um, we are examining the portfolio or Buffalo model of ADEX mm -hmm. for California, do we know of that model since since it's just like our portfolio is it portable I I think we're going to have to to review that I mean the, all these things will have to be discussed at the board so there's there's a lot of questions out there how this is going to work um, hopefully we'll have more background information to bring as we get ready to go into the regulatory process so stay tuned mm -hmm. And I just want to um, add one more thing. The examination that I observed was not the patient integrated, not the patient center integrated model. Yeah. So it was not the Buffalo model. It was a, the regular format. I just wanted to add that for, for those that might not know, the popularity of the ADEX exam is enhanced, let's put it that way, by the fact that 
It is currently accepted in either 46 or 47 of the states for licensure out of 50. So the ADEX exam, the, the organization, the American Association of Dental Examiners, which is the organization that has developed uh, the, this examination, their goal is to have it as a universal licensing exam, and, and they're almost there. They only have two or three more states to go. Uh, but the, uh, they are, there have been inquiries for other schools from the ADEX organization to administer that exam. ADEX exam is not administered by the American Association of Dental Examiners. The ADEX examination is administered by regional testing agencies like REB and CERTA and NERB and those other organizations. Uh, they purchase that exam from American Dental Association of American Dental Examiners and then administer the exam themselves. But it is not administered by ADEX. It is developed by ADEX, but administered by regional examination testing agencies. Okay, there's no further discussion. I'll move on to E, which I've already touched on. So we're beginning the um, occupational analysis of dentistry. We haven't had a review for quite a while, so this will prove to be very beneficial for us. And uh, ADEX will be paying for that, so the delay has been in starting to ensure that we had the authority to go ahead and spend the money and then to be reimbursed for, for the cost. So we'll be working out a contract with the ADEX folks. We've already begun discussions with them about uh, how this is going to work, but there's been no hesitation on their part in terms of recognizing what the charges uh, may be and moving forward with reimbursing the board quickly. So uh, that's moving along well. On item number F, there's uh, just an update on the implementation of AB 2235. Uh, essentially, there were a number of things. This was the Caleb Sears, uh, Caleb's Law uh, that was passed last year. And through this, uh, the board <clears throat> received spending authority to hire a staff person. But again, we did not receive that authority until July 1st. So we are in the recruitment process to be able to hire a permanent associate level governmental program analyst, which will be huge, who can be the, the point of reference on the board for anesthesia related issues. We're hoping to get this person involved in tracking and um, uh, get, get our program um, really focusing towards some of the data that we're able to receive. So uh, I've outlined what the three bullets of that particular law, I believe, does. And just so that you know, we are in the process of working through that. But uh, we've held off uh, primarily because of staff resources. So we'll be overcoming that challenge soon here. Um, in conclusion of my report, I just wanted to take the opportunity to Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. The challenges that Jim and I have been going through since March have been, uh, have been great. And the outpouring of love and prayers from you all um, has been humbling. But I'm happy to report that he has responded very well to his chemotherapy. Um, his tumor markers are normal. And we're moving forward with surgery on Tuesday. And so I'm just asking you to keep us in your prayers. Um, we have no reason to believe he's not going to fully recover and have uh, a longer life. Um, so the staff is trained and on the ready. Um, if any board members have any questions, please feel free to contact Sarah and Carlos. They'll be my point people for the next two weeks. Um, you kind of can't keep me away from checking my emails and my voicemails. So I. Uh, as I told Dr. Wish, I'm still having my thumb on the pulse of everything that's going on, but I might be a little distracted. Um, but uh, thank you again for the support. Um, I, I first praise God for giving me the courage to continue to go through this, but I'm convinced that he has put you all in my life to be also my support team. So thank you all for that. And that concludes my report. Um, Karen, if it is therapeutic to you, would you 
keep us informed how it's going. Thanks. Absolutely. Okay, we're moving on with agenda on item number nine. Dr. Morrow, did you want to take this? Uh, I think there's information in, in your uh, materials packet that pretty well explains the situation as where we are at this point in time. Uh, just a bit of a review, as you remember. Uh, Back in December of 2016, uh, the board granted provisional approval to the University of Medicine and Pharmacy at the Republic of Moldova. And the provisional uh, approval was based on deficiencies in two of the standards. Uh, and uh, provisional approval is for a 24 month period, at which time the school needs to submit documentation to support that they are in compliance with the deficiencies that were identified. Uh, and we did receive a packet of information uh, from the university through their representative here, Senator Polanco. And that information was uh, distributed to all of, the, all of the dentist members of the site visit team for review. And uh, following review, it was accepted as meeting the requirements for standard 1024.1 C6, which states uh, that the, uh, the program needs to be designed so that it would uh, assure the competencies that were identified. There were 13 competencies that were identified. So the uh, documents that were submitted were assessment forms, competency assessment forms in grade sheets that would evaluate those 13 competencies for the students. And that was well and good. Uh, that shows that it is designed to do it. But standard 1024.1 C8 states that the, uh, that the institution must employ the assessment of competencies for their graduating students. So this documentation that was submitted did not include any data collection that was implementing the successful employment of or use of those or implementation of those uh, assessment forms. So the site visit team uh, recommended to uh, our executive officer that uh, the application and the submissions did not satisfy us that they had demonstrated compliance with the two standards that the site visit team felt that they were deficient in. And uh, you also have a letter, then a copy of a letter that was written to uh, the rector and the dean of the dental school, rector of the university and the dean of the school of dentistry. Uh, the uh, the university was notified that they were still not meeting compliance with our standards, so the provisional approval was still in effect. And that uh, data generated from the employment of those competency assessment forms and grade sheets, data representing the employment of and the result of or the outcomes assessment of the implementation of those forms must be submitted and it must, have, must be from at least one year's graduating class, and that has to be submitted within the 24-month period in order for them to obtain full approval. So we are now waiting to receive that additional information. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to refer them to Karen. <laughs> Assessment. Oh, sorry. So the competency assessment are. Oh. So the competency is. I'm catching up with the process. So the competency assessment that we are requesting is the form on how they do it. Is that correct? 
uh, the competency assessment forms are a, a, a representative of that their plan, their curricular plan was to assess competency. What we're asking for now is give us the results of the implementation of that plan, okay. which we have not received. It's good to plan to do something, but if you don't do it, it hasn't been done. Correct. So one statute says that the, or one code standard says that the institution must plan a process by which those competencies will be assessed. The second one says you have to employ that plan and give us the results of the data that was collected from that uh, uh, assessment. We haven't received the data. So the second part of the question is, it looks like the different areas of competency are didactic as well as clinical or performance. Do we have, once we receive the data, do we in the process examine what is the minimum before we can continue with the uh, uh, process of review? In other words, you may give your data and if it's below a certain threshold, mm -hmm. then it's not considered and what do we use for our standard to compare? Yeah. So if we receive data that does not support that their graduates were competent in those required competencies by our current standards, then obviously they would not receive approval. What are we using for our um, standard? Is you mean the, stan the, the, the standards themselves? The yes. standards are, are in regulations okay. that they have to meet. Okay, they were, they were listed here, uh, and I think I'm asking: Is there a numerical number we're looking? A magic number? No, it's either it's either you're you're competent, you were judged, you were assessed to be competent, or you weren't. Okay. Uh, this is a, a competency, is is what can you do alone without any uh, faculty members' assistance? No, uh, I, I meant the aggregate, the aggregate number. Is there an aggregate number that we're looking for? That depends on, the, on the, the, the design of the scoring sheets. Are, are you looking at a percentage or are you looking at a, a, a score? Yes, there is a passing score on an assessment form. So in other words, we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for competency. Let me, let me reframe the question. If we look at, let's say, a model of accreditation, mm -hmm. then when a school um, determines how many pass, how many go into, I think we talked about this, mm -hmm. uh, go into um, post-grad programs or they go into licensure, then there's a certain number that says that, that um, they are competent or what the school is performing is competent to deliver those deliverables. Mm -hmm. Do we have something like that for, it may be in statute, I, I, don't, I don't know that. Is there a percentage before we can tell um, Moldavia that you are delivering as an aggregate now? Mm -hmm. all, the, all the candidates are coming out. Uh, usually an assessment form sets a scoring factor of one to five, say for instance, okay? Okay. And five would be everything was perfect and one would be you screwed the thing up completely, okay? So somewhere in between, that form is going to set a number, which is this is the minimum number you can have in order to be considered competent. Let's say on a one to five, that might be a three, okay? So in the, in the implementation of that scoring process, uh, faculty members or assessors are going to assess on a one to five scale, where does this lie, this particular factor that I'm scoring. There might be 10 factors on, on the sheet. So the aggregate of that then is going to say you must have scored at least a, a three in order to say that you passed that competency, that you demonstrated that competency. Anything below that three would say you didn't demonstrate the competency. So we would obviously look at those scoring sheets that they have developed and said, what is your score that you have set for competency? And were all of those demonstrating competency? If they graduated, they should have demonstrated competency in all of the 13 
areas that we're looking at. Then these are uh, clinical excuse me. areas. Uh, they are not. <clears throat> this is all a very interesting discussion, but I think we're getting a little off topic here. Okay. So <laughs> maybe we could take this offline and. Well, you know. let me let me finish it out then, because um, we do have a singular sampling of De La Salle and how many classes, and to determine their numbers. It, this is an this is an informational report, mm -hmm. and I think you know we're we're going okay. beyond what's on the All agenda right. for discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. But but I but not to totally cut Dr. Chan off. If you if you um, want to try to craft something as a future agenda item for discussion. I think that that would be appropriate and if you'd bring that up at the end of the meeting when it talks about future agenda items so that we can write that down. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Dr. Moore? Quick question. Is this based on the there was some question about five-year program or six-year program, and that was part of the report that we were. Uh, so it was clarified that they have a five-year program. Okay. Okay. okay, if there's no further questions, I'd like to invite represent. Oh, it's public comment. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Mary McCune, <clears throat> CDA. Um, so I just had a clarifying or two clarifying questions. So we understand that there's also a two-year international program at Moldova. How is that, how could that potentially negatively be affected by the school not passing probation, if at all? <laughs> I, I think the focus of our attention right now is the approval of the school itself. And, and I would say that they're provisionally approved and that they should probably be very careful the other things that they're doing so as not to jeopardize the provisional approval. We can't really discuss the two-year program because it's not on the agenda, but I'd be happy to have a sidebar with you later. Okay. And then my, my second question is um, if the board knows, or if Dr. Morrow knows, if how the students are being notified of the probation of the, the school and the effects if they don't pass probation for the students currently in the program? I uh, didn't understand. So, so if, the, if the school does not pass the probation within the 24 month period, are the students notified that they're potentially not able to get California licensure at the end? Uh, uh, I would hope they would be notified. I don't know for sure whose responsibility that would be. I would say that's the but, school's responsibility. Uh, I would certainly hope that they would be notified that the school has, has not been approved. Okay, I was just wondering if the school notified the Dental Board in a report or anything about that. No, again. It's the school's responsibility to make sure that the students entering their program know that they have a two-year provisional approval. And so that those students who graduate essentially within that pre, um, approval period would be accepting, we'd be accepting that education as a pathway to licensure within California. When the approval expires, if there are people currently in the program, they would not be able to use that as their educational requirement in California. Okay, thank you. I would like to follow up with that one. Um, only because then, then at the end, those students that are not maybe adequately notified by the by the school itself are going to be posed at a risk. And if the university doesn't really, or the I'm sorry, the, the school doesn't really notify the, the the students, then whose responsibility would it be um, to make sure that they're not going into debt for something that there's not valid? This is a state school in Moldova. Okay. Um, and it's it's the school's responsibility to notify the students. Uh, I have put it in strong form to uh, Senator Polanco, who's the representative, that all advertising needs to show that it's a provisional approval. We show on our website that the school is provisionally approved and an explanation of what provisional means. Okay. Okay. Okay, if there's no other discussion, I'd like to invite representatives from the Dental Hygiene Committee. Welcome. Uh, 
Good morning, members of the board. I want to uh, thank the dental board for the opportunity to report on our dental hygiene committee I'm activities. I'm sorry, I, we know who you are, but could you identify yourself for the record? I'm too? getting to that. <laughs> but that's a good question. And, and of okay, course, Tony so, needs no introduction. Um, so. uh, I, am, <laughs> I am Susan Good, and I'm the vice president of the dental hygiene committee, along with Anthony Lum, uh, our interim executive officer. Our president, Noelle Kelsch, um, sends her apologies, but she could not be here today, so I'm going to be providing this update to you. The committee has been very busy addressing the following. Uh, first, sunset review. 2018 is our committee's sunset review year, so staff has been gathering information and statistics for the report. The committee appointed a subcommittee of two members to address existing and new issues to be presented in the report. The subcommittee is scheduled to meet in early September uh, to draft proposed language for the full committee to review and an additional sunset meeting in October. The committee is continuing its review of all dental hygiene educational programs throughout the state. What we have found so far in the short time we have reviewed them is that many schools are needing some guidance to conform with the law to teach the students appropriately. Some issues that we have discovered frequently are deficient Commission on Dental Ed Accreditation CODA procedures, grading policies, and some infection control issues that have since been corrected. The committee has also been working on regulatory packages that help us to do the following. Uh, first, Assembly Bill 2859, Chapter 473, Statutes of 2016, provided the statutory authority to establish a retired license category. So the committee has been working on language to set the parameters for such a retired dental hygiene license. Second, California Code of Regulations, CCR 1150, 1151, and 1153, uh, provide the guidelines for out-of-state dental hygiene licensees to participate in sponsored free health care clinics in California. The regulation revision identifies the procedures an out-of-state practitioner can, form, uh, can perform under direct supervision and to list them on a name tag, primarily the SLN duties, to inform the patient. Lastly, minor changes for two rulemaking files uh, for increased clarity. The first non-substantive change to CCR section 1107 adds charts to the regulatory language for local anesthesia and nitrous oxide training. The second, CCR section 1105, realigns the faculty requirement uh, language for faculty at dental hygiene schools. Some programs are unclear as to the specific faculty requirements for schools. So this requirement of the regulatory language will assist, uh, will assist in clarifying the requirements. The committee is also working to update its laws and regulations book to incorporate new and existing language that was not contained in prior versions. The committee will be working with the DCA Office of Publications and Design to create the new book. The search for our new executive officer commenced with the advertisement of the position through the Cal HR and DCA websites and ended August 4th. We do not know the number of applications received, but the next step is for the appointed selection committee to vet through the applications and prepare for interviews. The committee would like to thank the Dental Board for its assistance and cooperation in reviewing two dental licensees that have been contributing to the substandard operations of a dental hygiene school. One was the program director and the other was a faculty member, both of whom were not teaching, training, or providing the students the education they deserved and paid for. The school and president have worked hard to fix the situation and to become compliant to the law, and the prior program director has resigned. The committee also appreciates the ongoing communication and cooperation between our two programs and the relationships that have been built. This concludes the committee's report. Are there any questions? Having been involved in a couple of EO searches and sunset reviews, I wish you the best with both. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Next uh, report on the June 14th, 2017 uh, California Dental Oral Health Program Advisory. Oh, I'm sorry, elective facial cosmetic surgery. Okay, I'll take that one. Um, 
I think most of you are familiar with the elective facial cosmetic surgery program. It uh, exists under the board and is handled by a committee of the board that meets to review applications for single degree oral and maxillofacial surgeons uh, to, re uh, to acquire uh, basically privileges through the board to uh, perform uh, certain procedures related to uh, elective facial cosmetic surgery. Uh, the committee met on April 15th via teleconference uh, to review uh, one application for a permit. Uh, uh, the application was considered and the following recommendation was made that we issue a uh, EFC uh, elective facial cosmetic surgery for category two privileges limited to cosmetic soft tissue con contouring or rejuvenation which may include but not be limited to uh, facelift, blepharoplasty, skin face, uh, facial skin resurfacing, or lip augmentation limited to Botox and fillers. Um, based on consideration of the application, we recommend that the board issue a Category 2 permit uh, to uh, Dr. Tilner, who was the applicant. So we would ask the board to do two things. First, uh, accept the EFCS credentialing committee report. And so I guess I'd like a motion to do that. We'll take these separately. Okay. Shannon Morrow? Yes. Uh, yes, by all means, before we take the vote. Thank you, Ellen Felsenfeld, CDA. Just a question on the agenda item itself. Uh, I'm assuming that there's a template that you're using. There's a Dr. Norris listed in the first paragraph. Is that an error? At least in our, in our uh, word packet? I'm assuming it's Dr. Tilner instead of Dr. Norris down there. Am I the only one that has that? I'm, yeah, I'm on I, I, recommendation. I see what you mean. Okay, okay sorry. Bernie Vaba, licensing manager. Uh, yeah, that is a typo. We caught that a couple of days ago, and I should have brought that up. It should, it should be Dr. Tilner. Tilner. Okay. Yeah, that was, well, I, I, was, I was on the conference call, so that was what I remembered. <laughs> and I, I would ask the board to amend the uh, motion to fire Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, Bernie. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion in a second. Time for the vote. Burton? Yes. Chan? Yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Motion passes, Mr. President. So now I'd like a motion to accept the committee's recommendation to issue Dr. Tilner an EFCS permit. Uh, for limited category two privileges, that's limited to Botox and fillers as described. So, Dr. Chan and Dr. Lay, okay. Dr. Chan and Lay. Public comment? Seeing none, would you call the roll, please? Yes, calling the vote. Um, Burton? Yes. Chan? Yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Motion passed, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we'll move ahead with agenda item 12, report on the dental director's oral health program advisory committee. Okay. And Fran? Yeah, Fran will take over this one. <laughs> You can double team this, but Fran, have a few lead off. <laughs> uh, the California Oral Health Program Advisory Committee Partnership June meeting was an update on the oral health program, including communication strategies and the availability of local training and technical assistance. This year, $37.5 million will be available for funding to the department of public health for the state dental program. The spending authority was achieved through the budget process. 
And so in that budget process, um, 22.5 million will be available for local assistance and 15 million for, state for the state appropriation. And the state oral health program received 11 positions, um, including the general, general health director, the, a health research scientist to a HMM1, a AGPA, um, and the director will be Glenda Jackson, who will be the health program manager. So under that state health program, there are four sections, intervention, local health, surveillance and evaluation, and technical assistance. The, what the, what the plan is, is to work with all 61 local health jurisdictions and funding directly to community-based organizations will probably take place in two years. And one of the things that, that they made very clear is receiving the money, they need time to, to ramp up. Um, <clears throat> the priority will be a survey of all third grade students in terms of their dental health needs. In terms of projects going forward, it's anticipated that the base grants for programs will be between 100,000 100, to 150,000 with additional funding uh, available after year one. Um, there was also some discussion about target audiences. And so the focus coming forward will be um, on the elderly. And there's another list. about that. Um, <clears throat> they talked about key messages for the health plan. And one of the things was the statement on the overall impact to California on oral health impacts in the in whole community and oral health is achievable. Access to improve oral health, quality, diversity, and communications to communicate to communities of color. There was also some further discussion about how to get that communication out. And part of the discussion was about um, having some interactive interaction between the communities and our uh, program, our state dental board, and the DHCC. County offices of education, church, churches would also be a target for messages, as well as medical providers, and uh, particularly uh, primary care clinics. So it was a very informative meeting. Um, I am, I was particularly impressed with the amount of work that they have done in sh such a short, short period of, of time. Um, I think that's kind of all I have, unless you have something else that you'd like to add. No, you gave a very good overview of the meeting that we attended. And if you look into this booklet, this pamphlet that- um, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> that Fran had brought back for all of us, there's a lot of there's a lot of data in here that was um, coming from the gender board uh, reports. So I think there's a really good uh, working relationship between the state uh, you know, oral health uh, division and also the gender board. So I would encourage that we continue to work with them 
um, to, to assess the access to care issue. Um, so thank you, Fran, for bringing this back to all of us. Okay. I did want to add that toward the end of the meeting, there was some discussion about future meetings and some next steps going forward. And the plans are to address some specific populations, the elderly, people with special health needs, including HIV, diabetes, and other chronic conditions, the refugee population, and the homeless. So there's no date yet for the next meeting, but this was a very, very full meeting, and um, I, I think that the dental director is to be applauded for just jumping in with both feet and, and getting started on this, particularly with um, the added blessing of the uh, tobacco funds. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, in reading like the first page of this, um, and tooth decay and conditions with children, I'm just thinking how could the Dental Hygiene Committee help in that since I, I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think they see many children. How can we implement our dental hygiene committee to also take the load or help some of them? I, I think I, they should be included in that type of meeting. And, and I'm going to defer to Anthony and say that I don't believe you have a representative that attends this meeting, do you? because that would be very helpful. Hi. Anthony Lem, interim executive officer. Um, no, we don't have a representative that's attending that meeting. Um, I'm sorry, but I, could, I couldn't hear what the question was when in the audience. It, it was given the, the, the emphasis on tooth decay, it, it mm -hmm. seems that you guys should be very involved in the implementation of this. Especially for educating this. children. Uh, sure, I, I agree with that. And I can work with dental board staff to yeah, because I think catch us up to, to speed on this. Right? Hygiene what? is where it starts. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I think you should be involved. Sounds, sounds like a good plan. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I can talk to uh, dental board staff, and they can catch us up okay. with what's been going on. Okay. We can put you in contact with the Thank program you. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Okay. Um, I, I think the last thing that I would say is that um, I would encourage you who work with your local communities to work very closely with your counties on funding and ideas for proposals going forward. I saw another hand over here. Yeah. Think, I'm sorry, I didn't keep track of order. Kathleen, would you like to go next? Yes, yeah, so I, I don't think anybody would be surprised to know that this is my passion, especially around children. And we screened 11,200 children in Santa Clara County last year with dentists, licensed dentists, and 29% had urgent or emergency needs. 7% of the three to five-year-olds had severe tooth decay, infection, or pain. And so I'm wondering how we get our information into this committee. Um, you know, how do we share that? And then my second point is, if they're going to survey a group of children, they should probably try and make it the same year that Ed Code requires dental screenings, because it, it would then, you know, complement the information that Ed Code's hopefully getting or the education department's already getting. So. And there is a representative from the Department of Education who is is there and very actively involved. And as a matter of fact, he's married to the person who is going to be um, the, the the director there who is at um, health at, at public health. And so he is very, very actively involved. Um, so our um, um, first five California. And so there is that active education component. One of the things that 
we had talked about earlier is I know you probably know who I know people there by name. I don't know necessarily what counties they're from and maybe to put her in contact with if you know the person from her county who is there. I don't think there's any rep representative from Santa Clara County at the meeting that I'm aware of. Not even Cal, uh, not, not even public not, not from not from um, not from your county. Mm -hmm. If you're looking, but I, you know, I I think that you should work with the Santa Clara County uh, Public Health Department, you know, um, to share with them the data that you know that you have. Oh, don't worry, they're very aware <laughs> okay. of that data. I'm, you know, I'm not a shrinking violet on that stuff, so it's not that. I think our county's very aware. It's how do we become part of this effort. Dr. Stewart. A uh, question for Fran. You mentioned that uh, there's going to be a focus on the elderly. Can you kind of flesh that out a little bit for many of us have an interest in that community and did they have any kind of an action not, plan? Not really. That's, that, that's going forward. And so it was just in the list of things that are going to be focused on. It wasn't a lot of specifics there. That was at the very end of the day. So perhaps you can keep us current uh, as the thing, projects develop and keep us informed. Um, yes. I would also add that one of the other things that, that Hoon and I talked about at the end of the meeting is just looking at the statistics alone that, that um, Kathleen gave for her county. When you think about the number of children with serious, serious decay. And then the need for not only extensive treatment, but um, possibly being in a situation where there may be down the road some need for anesthetic to help correct that. Um, that I, I think that it would be a good idea for us to talk more to um, Dr. Kumar about that issue and how we can help to mitigate that so that we don't go down this road that we've been on. Thank you. Uh, public comment? Hi, Gail Mathy, CDA. I thought I might provide a little uh, additional maybe structure that will help address, help understand kind of the structure for how this will roll out. Um, Fran mentioned the money that's coming from Prop 56 and that it's going to be allocated a base amount will go to each county and then there's additional money that will go based on the population and poverty in each county. And the way it's being pushed out is very much to the local health departments, as you mentioned, to drive and address, drive the planning and then address the needs. So Kathleen, to your you know, comment, that work will really be going on, the strategic plan that's developed there, the responses to, so how do we deal with what we are seeing in our own county will obviously look different from county to county, right? But bringing together all of the stakeholders in the hygienists and the dentists and the first fives and the stakeholders in each county to create that plan, to determine how that money will be spent, to mitigate the disease, whether it's child-focused, senior-focused, you know, what are the needs in our individual community? So we'll be driven very much at that local level by the local folks that are making the plans and uh, objectives and, you know, strategies to address them. So hopefully that's a little extra info. There's no other discussion on this item? Okay, let's move ahead. Uh, next, we'd like to have an update on portfolio. Sarah Wallace, Assistant Executive Officer with the board, and I have Bernie Vaba with me. He is our Licensing and Examinations Unit Manager. We've included in the board meeting materials today an update on our portfolio pathway to licensure. Uh, we have been able to 
we, the, the portfolio pathway has been implemented since November of 2014. And so we've provided an outline of the number of applications that have been received and approved over the last three years. In 2017, we have received 21 applications for portfolio licensure. So far, we have issued six applications to date. Those that have not been issued licenses are pending uh, due to deficiencies, uh, missing items in their applications, and staff works very closely with those candidates to address those deficiencies, and I expect licensure to be complete within the next 30 to 60 days. Staff has also scheduled a meeting with the examinations chair, Dr. Lay, which is going to be held on Monday, this coming Monday, to discuss an outreach plan to the, for the schools for the promotion of the portfolio examination as well. Did you have anything to add, Dr. Lay? Well, I, I, I know of the students from USSF that applied uh, for a portfolio. Um, then what happened was that they got accepted into AHED or GPR programs. Then they abandoned the application for portfolio. Um, again, you know, and then I, one of them actually took grab. Um, so I think that, that we need to, of course, portability is probably the issue, you know, with portfolio. Um, I like to, uh, I've also have, you know, um, heard some concerns, you know, from some of the students about the application process. So I've talked to Karen and I, you know, um, the staff has been working really hard on, um, you know, the portfolio uh, licensure pathway. Um, so we hoping to come up with some ideas how we can promote it um, so that we could improve the communication between the board and also the, the faculty at the dental schools and how we can get the message out to the students. Because as we know, we issue 680, we have 680 graduates every year from the state of California. Why is the number of the applicants for portfolio is so low? We, and we know for a fact that the majority of them probably will stay in California. Um, so what are the pathways of licensure that these candidates are using? Um, so I, I do think that, uh, you know, the portfolio has been rolled out um, for about three years now, and the numbers are not getting better. Um, I think that we need to connect with the dental schools, with the students, and see what we can do in order to, um, to promote it. Um, so I'll be working with the staff um, in the new future uh, to come up with some ideas, some strategies, so that we can um, improve the data. Thank you. Okay. Mo yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. On page three, the second paragraph, the bottom of the paragraph um, has, a, has a statement, the portfolio deficiencies that the participating schools need to correct. What does that mean? Where, where were come some of these deficiencies? It could be any number of deficiencies, missing documentation included in the application, a, a fee that was not paid. It wasn't a deficiency that was sent from the school itself, but from the applicant. Got it. Question? Dr. So Black. from what I'm hearing, most of the students or candidates complain of portability. So I think that's a, a, a roadblock that most, you know, that's what I'm hearing from, from some candidates. Um, I know, Dr. Morrow, you worked on, there, there were four that, four states that will be, that take our portfolio. How can we develop that better? Whether or not a state will accept the portfolio, the results of the portfolio examination in California is up to that state's dental board or their equivalent agency. Uh, and there have been a number of dental boards that have considered uh, this acceptance and some have moved to accept it and others I haven't heard the results from. But that would be a, a state by state or state dental board uh, decision to make. Uh, and uh, 
at least two states that I know of have made that decision. That's Colorado and Kentucky. Uh, there are others that are considering it. So do we communicate with them or do they know, do most states know we have this? In the cases that I'm familiar with, they have communicated with us as seeking information and that information has been provided to them. And I have in one case made a personal visit and gave a presentation to that dental board regarding the uh, portfolio examination. I have also given presentations to a number of student groups in different states that have requested information regarding the portfolio exam so that they could uh, maybe put some pressure, you might say, against their state dental boards to consider accepting the results of it or implementing it in their own school. Thank you. Any other comments from board members, public comment on portfolio? Okay, seeing none, we'll move ahead with agenda item number 14, a review of dental licensure and permit statistics. I think, Bernie, you were going to take this one, right? I'm going to, I was actually going to take oh, it. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, the, the board meeting packets include statistics from our dental licensure and permit program. There are overall counts included in the packet, breaks, breakdowns of active licensees by county, and then monthly dental statistics by pathway regarding applications that have been received, reviewed, approved, denied, withdrawn, et cetera. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Just a point of information. Um, the licensure by residency, is that just for CODA approved residencies? including GPRs and AEG? Yes. Oh, yes? It is, it is only for AEGD or GPR, not for specialty residencies. Oh. Oh. And um, just looking at the numbers, I'm assuming that those numbers will change for 2017 because the data were only updated. I mean, yes, was only yes. As so this was only through July June. 6, yeah. Um, essentially the end of June and again as I reported with the dental assisting licensure statistics there may be some inconsistencies between this and the last board meeting we're still working with the statistical program to ensure that they're ac accuracy so. any other board member questions public comment okay seeing uh, just for uh, Administrative purposes, I, we've had a request to take a break around 10.30. Uh, would the board like to take this next agenda item or take a break now? How long? 15 minutes. Just give everybody a chance to check out of their hotel rooms. Okay, let's take a break now. We'll come back at approximately 10.40 and... Um, see you all then. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. I thought I saw Ms. Burton around somewhere. Yeah. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, resume with the, uh, the REB report. Dr. Lay, I believe you were going to take this. <clears throat> okay, so okay, so um, I attended the Dental Examination Review Board meeting on June twenty third in Phoenix um, at the rep office. Um, so during the meeting, um, there was a representative from the American Dental Association. Um, licensure Task Force, um, Dr. Gary Jeffers, who came to talk about the OSCE, you know, uh, pathway. Um, and we also, um, but the main thing that was discussed at that meeting was the format changes for the REP exam uh, in 2018. So the, the changes are as follows. The, the candidates will have will have patients 
for two operative procedures. If they pass the first one, they will not need to do the second one. If they did not pass the first one, the second one or second patient will be taken on the second or third day. In the endo section, the extracted teeth will no longer be used. The endo portion will have the plastic teeth that will be provided at the exam. The perio section will be available. The patient, if the candidate fails the perio section, they can retake it on the on the next day, or day two or day three. Rep will provide an optional pros section, which will include um, two crown preps. Um, California at this point in time is not requiring the pros portion. For those candidates who want to do that, they can opt in. Um, but as far as California is concerned, the candidates do not have to do that one. The written exam um, that will include th three patient cases, um, and this time there would be one pediatric case. Um, there were some states that worried about the changes um, because those changes will need approval from their own boards. So there were a lot of discussions on the format changes. I did inform the Dental Examination Review Board of what California may do because of the major changes. Um, although to some, they may not be major changes, but for California Board, they could be considered as major changes, and that is um, only requiring the candidate to do one filling, and if they pass, they don't have to do the second one. Um, so in my opinion, that is you know a major change. As far as the plastic teeth being used for endo exam, CDCA uses the same, so I don't see that as a major change. Um, perio, there was a lot of confusion there because um, some many states that accept RAP do not require perio, so I think right now perio is listed as optional. However, it is for us, you know, is a required section. Uh, so I believe that there has been some confusion about that. Um, so basically, you know, it's the format changes of the exam in 2018 that, um, you know, that I want to bring it to the board um, because, um, you know, it, it will be a different exam somewhat. I mean, it's the same exam. It's just that, you know, because of the requirements that are uh, changed. Um, you know, it, I think it's something uh, that should be discussed. And I think with us today are Dr. Norm Magnusson and also rep psychometrician Sharon Osborne. Um, so they're here so that they could um, provide answers to any questions uh, that the board members may have. So that concludes my report. If you have any questions, um, you know, please ask, and I'll try to answer. If I can't, then I think Dr. Mexson and Sharon, you know, will be able to um, to provide the answers. Uh, Dr. Morrow, you know, it is it is my expectation that the examination that was the Reb examination that was originally accepted by uh, by OPS and our uh, professional occupational analysis is expected. To continue unless unless we change our opinion. In other words, if the perio section is an option, and a candidate taking the Reb examination in Illinois applies to California for licensure and they opted out of the perio section, would they be qualified in California with that altered examination? I guess that's probably a legal question. I, I think staff's prepared to take some of those questions, but before we go ahead, I just notice in the memo that even though they say you can do up to two restorative procedures under the operative section, this is under the summary of 2018 exam format changes put out by REB. If you look at the last line, it says a direct anterior class three uh, remains as an option for states that require it. So for 
I mean, the way I read this for purposes of California, if we wanted to continue with the exam that was given previously, that would be an option. Right, but, but my, I, I agree with that. But mm -hmm. my, my concern at this point is that the applicant who is taking that examination opts out of the second procedure are we going to accept the results of that examination for licensure in California because it wasn't the examination that we had approved? That, that question has come up. Um, did Karen or Sarah want to address that? Well, uh, staff's view is that because the REB exam, the elements of the REB examination are not clearly outlined in statute and regulation that at this point we believe that the board would be able to essentially rely on the examination that was last reviewed by OPES to determine its validity but we would need to get um, we would need to get OPES's and legal's um, opinion mm -hmm. on that Okay. That's, that's staff's opinion. So there is a question there regarding the acceptance of this modified examination. Yes. That has to be answered. Yes, and we are starting to get questions. I did get an email from the director of a program in New York saying that they anticipate having 69 students take the REB and that they urgently wanted to know what the response was going to be uh, because the deadline for filing for REB is something like September, early September. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to know, essentially, they wanted guidance on what the board would be doing. I have not yet responded. Okay. Any, <clears throat> any other questions from board members? I just would like clarification from the board about the changes that are recommended. I mean, do they significantly impact a candidate's ability to be licensed or not? Uh, Aside from the discussion that the board has had in the past about we strongly believe the portfolio method of testing a student along the way as opposed to having a single exam. Setting that aside, are there any concerns about the changes that have been proposed? Uh, my primary concern would be the opting out of the perio section completely. In other words, the operative section, uh, if I did if I was a candidate for that examination and this, the, the current form of that examination would be that I had to do two restorations, one posterior, could be a composite or, or an amalgam, and one anterior that obviously needs to be a composite. Uh, however, the change is simply saying if I do one of them and I do it at a score of three or above, then I'm okay. And, and I, can, I can deal with that, okay? I don't have to do two to demonstrate competency when I can do one and demonstrate competency. But opting out completely in the perio section would not be acceptable to me. I believe that the candidate does need to be examined clinically on perio skills and abilities to scale and root plane, even though it's only one quadrant, not a complete mouth. But you know, still, it is an assessment of their competency in that area. And to eliminate that completely would not be acceptable to me. Uh, I do not think that the perios portion is eliminated from the exam. No, it it's is, an option. Yeah, it is still part of the exam. But, it, but a candidate can opt it out if the candidate plans to practice in a state where perio exam is not required. Um, so I think that's probably the confusing part because California requires it. But on the, the REP website, it says it's, it can be opted out. And I think that's the confusing part for the California candidates because they think that because we accept in REP and now PERIO is optional, therefore does that mean that we can opt out? So I think that's the confusion part. 
Um, but the exam itself still has that portion, so it's not eliminated. Um, it's optional for, st for candidates who plan to practice in states that do not require the perio section. Oh. So, that, I, I mean that, so that's a difference there. I agree. I, I agree completely. However, my concern is that uh, individuals' plans often change. And because I plan not to practice in California, and I take the exam and opt out of the perio, uh, then unless the candidate is well aware of the limitations that that opting out uh, holds, then I'm concerned that we get an applicant from another uh, state that opted out of, didn't require that, and now the candidate, the applicant, wants to come to California and get a license. What are we going to do about it if they didn't have the perio? Or are we simply, and, and again, this is a decision we have to make, and I don't think here's the place to make it, but are we just going to say completion, successful completion of the REB examination will give you licensure? Whatever that examination content is, I don't think we're going to go there. So we have some things we need to talk about. Absolutely. Sir, I, I was just going to add that during the application process, board staff would need to work with REB to verify what components of the exam were taken to verify whether or not they're eligible for licensure in California right. pending the board's decision. Sarah, can you, sp ex can you expound upon essentially the information we currently get from REB shows the different sections that the candidates have taken. And if they failed any portion, they've essentially been, they've con been considered to have failed, failed REB. The exam. That's so, Yes, we get the, the breakdown sheet and the score sheet from REB, directly from REB, I believe, um, and staff has to verify that that information is correct. We also require that for the other pathways to verify that they, specifically LBC, where we have to verify that they have not failed an examination within five years. So knowing these changes are occurring, board staff will just be more diligent in reviewing the documentation that comes from REB to verify that they truly do meet the requirements for California. And, and I would hope also that the REB organization would take on the responsibility of making sure that the candidates that are taking their examination are aware of those states that require which sections before they register for the examination. Yeah, yeah. Norm Magnuson, Dr. Norm Magnuson, president of REB. And the answer to that question is yes, we, we actually do that now. Um, mm -hmm. As you well know, uh, there's 50 states and there's 50 different requirements. <laughs> Not every state's the same. Um, the other exams have the component, as we will this coming year, for the prosthetic component. Well, not every state requires the prosthetic component. Mm -hmm. um, some states require that you do a CAS goal. So we have states that uh, um, the candidate has to do a CAS gold. Well, they did not do a CAS gold and want to go get a license in that state, they have to retake the REB. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, a, a, the candidates have to be responsible for knowing which states they potentially might want to go into. And um, we tell them that in, in our uh, presentations at the schools, whether they take our exam or another one, it's still their responsibility to know. Um, the perio component is still part of the exam, and it is you have to actually opt out of it. So it's not like the PROS that you have to opt into it. Um, so it's still part of the um, perio, it's still part of the REB exam. We still feel it's very important. Most of us think that you ought to still be taking it. Um, but there are states that don't require it. And unfortunately, the candidates nowadays want to take a path of least resistance. And so they take the easiest portion they possibly can. Our recommendation is you ought to take all the parts of the exam, even if you don't plan on going to a state that has the prosthetic component. We think it would be good for you to do that so that if you decide to move that state, you are covered. And that's what we encourage the candidates to do. But we can't, they sign up for it. We, we can't get on the web page with them and help them out. We wish we could, but uh, you know, we love for them to, to help them in all way we can, but we inform them. I agree with you, and, I, and, and I, I'm sure, and I appreciate your, uh, your organization's diligence in informing the candidates that are taking the REB examination of what is required and what the limitations are, and et cetera. And I also agree with you that, and especially students, dental students, like to take shortcuts whenever they're available. Yeah. And they even make them when they're not available, so. <laughs> 
I would like for uh, uh, Sharon here to talk to you a little bit about the thought process that we had be behind the single tooth uh, restoration rather than two. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to have her explain that, if that's OK if with you, interested. if you're interested. I mean, this is a big deal. Um, and it's a big deal to us. It took us a long time to come to this conclusion. But we didn't come to it because we felt like it was the right idea. We came to it because Sharon did all the statistical analysis and showed us why it's the good idea to do. We, through this process, a candidate can still do two restorations. If they have to go to a state that requires a class three, they can do their class two composite, which is required, has been required um, on REB for a number of years. And so they can do, and then they can, and it always has been an option. There's not many states that require it. Um, 85, I think 85% of the candidates do two class twos now, uh, composites. They don't do amalgams anymore. And they only do a class three when they can't find two class twos to do. So, I mean, our statistics kind of show us that we're just doing, uh, grading the same preparation and restoration twice in 85% of the time. So I'll let Sharon do, just give you a couple numbers. Uh, just that what we have found is that, that, as you would expect from people who are eligible to take the exam, they ha either have a degree already, they have been certified by their dean to take the exam, or they've been approved by the board to take the exam. These people are going to do well on the exam. The vast majority pass upon their first attempt. And what we find is of those people who pass the operative section the first time, 97.5% have performed at competence or above on both of those procedures. So we're not learning much through that second procedure. It's a complex performance-based procedure. It's not one multiple choice question. It's a, it is a pretty big task that they have to do, the restorative exam. So we don't feel we're learning anything new by getting additional information from the second uh, procedure. I have looked extensively at this to make sure that we would not be in any way increasing the number of what we would call false positives, that is, allowing somebody to pass who is truly not competent. It is very unlikely if somebody gets, say, a 2.9 on their first procedure and then would have to proceed to a second procedure and then get an average of over 0.3, that they are going to be getting a 3.5, you know, accidentally when they're truly only a 2.9 level person. I mean, really, the, the likelihood of somebody being a false negative is much more likely than somebody being a false positive. It's much more likely that somebody just is not familiar with the examination logistics. They um, I think you were saying something about modification requests, like sometimes yeah. just it, it, making bad decisions about how to handle the um, protocol at the exam can sometimes lead to someone getting a score that is uh, underperforming when truly they may really be minimally competent. What we find is that people who are probably not competent are the ones who fail multiple times. They, they don't pass upon retake. They, they will fail three times in a row. That is why we require remediation. The likelihood that somebody would be misclassified more than two or three times if they're truly competent goes down considerably. There's extensive psychometric literature on this to show this. Um, so we believe that we are screening out the people that we are designed to screen out. And we're, you know, there's no point in making somebody who is truly minimally competent continue to de demonstrate competence when they've already done that. So we are very confident from the numbers and we can provide additional information. I'm preparing a manuscript for uh, publication on this. I think it's a really important issue. We also feel it's important that we're reducing the patient burden. We're reducing, lightening our footprint in the schools, um, just trying to make a more efficient yet still highly reliable and valid high fidelity exam on real patients. So, I could go on more. I think I'm done. So. <laughs> Any other questions from board members? Are there really a lot of uh, schools that, I mean, states that don't require perio? Perio seems to be the most important thing. Everybody gets a cleaning. Everybody needs perio. Why, why is it such a? If I might venture, and I'll certainly ask our rep. Is it why yeah. rep decided to fall into this category of not having it? I think makes, it has to no do. Sense to I think it really has to, having graded on that exam, I think it has to do with the difficulty of calibrating and evaluating that because there's so much patient variability and I can I think they can speak to that. Well, there's multiple reasons. I mean, I don't know why states don't require it. I, I agree. But we've, we're adding a prosthetic component where a candidate has to prep teeth on plastic teeth, a senior dental student. Now, tell me when the last time they practiced on plastic teeth 
in dental school. It wasn't their senior year. It wasn't their junior year, probably. It was probably their sophomore year. So we call that a sophomoric exercise. But states require it, okay? Well, we don't believe in a national exam. We just believe in being the best exam we can. We would like to have more states accept us. And in order for us to do that, we had to add a plastic tooth exercise. Now, we... I mean, and we develop the best one we can. Yeah, and it's going to be extremely comparable to all the other exams. But there are states that still think a candidate should practice that procedure. So we developed it. Why a state would say no to Perio, I have no clue. I'm on, I'm in boat with you. I, I if I have a, a when I was on my board, I wanted those candidates to be able to tell me that they can remove calculus. And, and be able to decide where there is calculus or not calculus. Um, and I, I could just add that, I mean, I've looked at years and years of data on the periodontal exam, and uh, ultimately I would conclude that it should be required, but I have found evidence for and against requirement. And the evidence against requirement would be that 87% of the candidates who, of the uh, periodontal attempts the raw scores are perfect scores. I mean, most people do extremely well on this exam. Very few people actually fail the exam, and very few, even less, fail it multiple times. Having said that, I think the evidence for keeping the exam is that there is a small number of people who fail due to validated major tissue trauma every year. There's a few people who do fail multiple times, even over many years. It's a very small number, but we're still screening those people out. So I would say it is it should be a requirement, uh, even though most people do pass it. I think a lot of people believe that it's, it's irrelevant because everyone passes it, and if they fail, oh, they would have failed something else anyway. Well, that's true a lot of the time, but there's still a small number who fail perio consistently. So, Also, I, I would just like to point out that we're also measuring other aspects of periodontal um, and prosthodontic what, what is the uh, content on our comprehensive treatment planning exam, which is an open-ended exam, which is graded by examiners. So people uh, have to complete three different treatment plans and answer open-ended questions that are assessed by uh, our examiners. Uh, when you talk about replacing a natural tooth with a plastic technique tooth for root canal treatments, you're knocking on my door uh, because I'm an endodontist. The last time that a student in dental school did a root canal treatment on a plastic technique tooth was probably in their sophomore year. Uh, they haven't touched a plastic tooth, if at all, uh, for the last two years of their education. And then they're thrown into an arena where they have a, fo a foreigner, a plastic tooth now that they need to treat. Our, our research and our studies have, we have not found a plastic tooth that really satisfies us with the, the nature and the characteristics of the material as being similar to enamel and dentin. Uh, I have, if, you, if you're saying the, that the uh, prosthetic uh, procedure is a sophomore procedure on a plastic tooth, then so is a root canal treatment. And I would agree with you, but we have ran into numerous problems with the extracted tooth. Mm -hmm. One, schools aren't, a aren't able to procure the types of teeth that we want for that procedure. So they either have massive decay or crowns or large fillings on them already. Two, some states are actually making laws or regulations that banned us from using human body parts as that portion of the exam. Three, there's a large portion of the teeth now coming from overseas where people in foreign countries will extract teeth just to sell them good teeth for the purpose of using on an exam. We didn't feel, I mean, we, we decided that, we just had to stop that. We spent many years, we, want, we talked about using plastic teeth a number of years ago, but we don't like the current model where the plastic teeth are um, not heat resistant. Because the techniques taught in dental school now are not lateral condensation. They are heat condensing condensation techniques. So we decided that, that we weren't going to use a plastic, plastic tooth, and we continue to use the natural teeth, even to the demise of many people who did not like us doing that. 
we finally found a vendor who will make a heat resistant tooth with uh, a crown on it that the plastic at least comes close to mimicking enamel and the plastic mimics dentin that actually has uh, uh, pulp tissue in it that's not like no normal pulp tissue, but it has a, you know, uh, a sense of pulp tissue. Um, so the students can still do the techniques that they're being taught in school. They don't have to learn a new, con a new lateral condensation. We are still gonna grade via x-ray like you do in your office because you don't take your tooth out to check it to see if you've got good condensation, at least I hope you don't. Um, so you leave the tooth in the mouth, in the, in the dentiform and take an x-ray and we grade it the same way we have always graded it before. So we've tried to keep this as close to the way that we have done it on natural teeth and we think we've done it. We do have the technique for that now. And we have done extensive field testing to show, show a high level of comparability. So we have numbers that actually show that the, yeah. So it's not been an easy decision. And yes, we're in the same boat that you are, but we had to make some changes. I understand. I actually have a question. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Magnuson and Ms. Osborne. I do have a question, though. In I'm sure that this has uh, you've been studying this for a while before implementing these changes. In the course of your discussions, have you been reviewing the states that actually use REB and trying to determine whether or not this would cause some problem in the states that currently authorize that in terms of their statute and regulation? Yeah, we have. In fact. The, dis the comment at the DERB meeting, um, there were some states that had the same concerns that you have. Um, most states don't have regulations that, s that, that depict what has to be on the exam. Now, some do, like the prosthetic component. I mean, some states, that's in their regulations. But a lot of the states just say, if the board accepts the REB exam, um, or sometimes the state says if it accepts a live patient exam from a, a, one of the regional testing agencies, I mean, it's pretty broad, all states have different ones, mm -hmm. um, that it, the exam would continue to be accepted. I mean, we didn't want to make this change until the psychometrician told us that this could be done because we just don't do it because we want to. I mean, she had to do all the hard work and the labor and, and actually convince us that it was a, a good reason to do it and what are we learning from somebody else. And one of the, one of the problems you have with these exams is live patients. Uh, huge, there's a big movement out there to try to take live patients out of the exam process. Well, that would take it out of the portfolio also because you, they treat live patients in that scenario also. So this is the way for us to reduce the amount of live patients if we can still get the correct information that we need to share with our states about minimal competency which I don't like that word. I don't like minimal competency. I wish we can find another one for that, but that's the legal term that we have to go by. So you know, we're just trying to do our due diligence on what's happening in the world of the testing agencies and the testing world for dentistry. And I think it's important for, to have the discussion about what our board feels is appropriately being tested. Um, I, I guess my concern is is the board at some point going to consider, gee, maybe we should be in statute or regulations having more specificity in terms of what is being tested? Now, we do have to comply with our own psychometric review, mm -hmm. and REB was reviewed in 2012. Um, staff will be researching whether or not we have the authority to tell candidates that our recommendation is for them to continue to take the REB as it is right this moment, because that was the last time it was reviewed by California. Uh, I'm not trying to say that yours isn't psychometrically sound, I'm sure it is, but I don't know whether the comparison we do in California is the same. It probably is, but that remains to be seen. So I'd say that board members, uh, staff is going to be trying to gather as much information we can um, to determine whether we need to do any emergency statutory changes or regulatory changes with regard to accepting the REB. I think that that would be the prudent way to move. 
so, and just to let you know, there are states, uh, we have one state that does require cast restoration. They're going to still require that, so that candidate will have to do two. I'll have to know which state they're going to. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of states who didn't have the class three as a requirement, might be thinking about doing that. I mean, there's a lot of things. This is going to affect a lot of people. Um, uh, but I still think it really puts the ball in the courts in state boards to really make a decision what they want to know sure. out of a candidate to, right. to, to grant them a license. And we, yes. that's your job, it's not mm -hmm. ours. Right. And so when we had two restorations and they're both doing class twos, is that really telling you anything about that candidate? No. Or is it better for you to tell us, hey, right. we want our candidates to take a class three, we have the capability to do that. We still have the rubics for that. We still have the sure. testing capability. We can still calibrate our examiners on that portion of the exam. We still will, in fact. Yeah. And um, uh, so. I, I just wanted to add something. Just uh, as far as the, the anterior uh, procedure, years of data show that it is a slightly easier procedure than the posterior procedure. That is why you, you could not complete one anterior procedure to complete. The, it has to be a posterior okay. to whatever. And, and just to yep. just to let you know that this this could uh, for staff this could prove to be some sort of a challenge in terms of tracking um, the portions of candidates who are particularly out of state who've taken it in another state and may have not have known of what the California requirement is. So I, I guess that's my concern um, that staff is going to be more diligent in seeing this and then what happens when the candidate who took the REB someplace else and opted out of something didn't realize it. I understand that Dr. Magnuson has said that they're going to um, try to get the word out, but is it going to be more than just check with your states? Probably well, not. Because that's a huge, that would be a huge responsibility for REB to yes, know what the requirements are. And, yeah, they yeah. change rapidly. I mean, states, there are states that didn't accept Reb last year and do accept it this year. I mean, there's a lot of things yeah, that are changing. Just find that out. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, we recommend that they go through Danby. They can through the Danby webpage. They can find the regulations or at least find okay. links to all the states. And the candidates really have to take some responsibility here too. I mean, we even though we try very hard sure. to get the information out, and it, we're adults. We're responsible for our own actions and our own sure. decisions, and and we have to uh, accept that. So. Okay. We encourage them as much as we can, but thank you. I, uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, I agree with you. I don't particularly like the ter expression minimum competency either. But I also don't <clears throat> really like the live patient because the alternative is a cadaver. And, you know, I don't know how we can do, but, you know, that sort of like, what, what else do you expect except a live patient? Certainly you expect them to be alive when you completed yeah. the exam and, and <laughs> hopefully alive when you started it. Uh, my second is the question. Uh, will REB make available to prospective candidates to purchase, if necessary, the technique tooth that you are going to be testing them on so that they can become familiar with the feel of that material before they are tested on using that material. Oh, definitely. They have the capability to, through the company, to purchase as many teeth as they want to, but they cannot purchase the exact teeth that we're going to be doing. No. Since we want them to have a little more of a live person experience here, not get the exact tooth, practice on it 20 times so that when they get to our exam, they can just be yeah. asleep and do it. Yes, and Again, I think my concern was the material itself, yes, they the can, feel yes, of lots, the material. They can purchase all the teeth that they want. They can practice as many times as they want. Good. But every tooth is individually 3D um, created. So it's it's not that they we do number eight as our exam. They can purchase nine, and it's the exact tooth. It's not. It will have components that are similar, but we have a technique to do an, a natural tooth 3D that's independent of all the other teeth. So if you get 14, it's not going to be like three. Sure. Appreciate that. A question? So I don't know if you can answer this to me, but what's the average cost of a dental student taking the REB? The average? If you can't tell me, it's fine, but I would like to know that. Well, and I can give you, to take any of the exams, um, all the major exams is probably between, it's really hard to tell because we don't know what all of them are, between 
$2,300 and $2,500. Um, that's if you take it at your school. You don't have to travel to do that. Um, so, uh, but it's, no, no, we've tried to keep this all um, very comparable to before. We, we understand the students have already got a big enough debt. So, I mean, we're a nonprofit, and let me tell you, we're a nonprofit. Um, so we try to make sure that we get enough to cover our costs and development. Development's getting to be a big deal these days because the exam is changing, and as you well know, that costs money to do. But yeah, we keep our costs as, as close uh, to our costs as can, and we're in comparable setting to all the other exams. You know, maybe to help answer that question, uh, it depends on how much the school charges Reb to rent yes. their facility, there, and, yeah. and that's different with different schools. So there's a contract that is entered in between the Reb organization and the dental school as to what yeah. it's going to cost Reb to use the school, because basically during the Reb examination, we have to shut down the school. We actually have some schools that don't charge at all. They have a zero fee. They just give it to the students, which is interesting. Is there any public comment on this item? OK. Thank you. That was very informative. I really appreciate you making the trip. <laughs> OK, we'll move along with uh, enforcement statistics and trend uh, number 16. Good morning, Carlos Alvarez, Enforcement Chief, Dental Board of California. Try to go, not quick, but I'll try to move along so we could try to get out of here earlier. We're, we're on schedule, Carlos. On schedule? So, yeah, we're on, I'll we're still on try schedule. To, okay, we're I'll, back on schedule. Okay, I'll still try to move quick. Uh, so agenda item number 16 is the enforcement statistics and uh, trends for April 1st, 2017 through June 23rd of 2017. And for uh, complaints and compliance, uh, there was an increase uh, from the last quarter of uh, 67 uh, complaints from the last quarter. And so uh, for the fourth quarter, we had 870 uh, complaints. And the monthly average for the quarter was 290 complaints. And uh, currently we have uh, 1,375 cases pending. And so when I say pending is that uh, we're requesting records, uh, we're waiting on records, and we're also waiting on dental consultant reports. And so currently that's what the uh, complaint compliance unit uh, has currently right now on their desk. And as I move on, I apologize because uh, it printed out pages four through, uh, it should be page two, page three, and for some reason, it continued on with page four. So as I move on to, and also, I'm sorry, also we have the, uh, the flow charts for everybody to uh, follow. Uh, so on uh, page uh, two, the complaints uh, closed. So we had uh, 570 cases that were closed, so that's an average about 190 uh, per month. So some of these cases they didn't meet any type of merit, no errors, and or they're non-jurors where we're able to close out. Uh, one of the highlights here is that the uh, process that it took to close the cases, uh, it was actually uh, 20 days uh, faster from the previous quarter. So that's a good highlight there. And I think part of it is, uh, is the cross-training that we did uh, with staff and you know ordering, uh, writing subpoenas, uh, proving the, the process to get uh, uh, records, and I think uh, part of it, I think that's what uh, the process was to get 20 days faster, so that's a good highlight there for us. Uh, for investigations, uh, currently uh, open, we have 985 uh, cases and 46 open inspection cases, and mind you, this is both, uh, both north and south that we have here. Uh, the only thing that we saw with the trend was that we did have an increase of 62% on investigation cases aged from zero to three months. And, but uh, we're focusing on priorities, and so we were focusing on the three years 
on the cases that we don't want to run out on statutes. So I believe that part of that reason is we had that increase because we're concentrating on the cases that were close to either expiring or we still had another year left on it, but we wanted to move faster. And so the investigations uh, closed. Uh, so investigations that went to attorney general's office or that went to the district attorney's office that had a criminal element uh, for the fourth quarter was 329. So that was an average of uh, 110 per month. And like I said, we have the uh, charts on chart one if anybody wants to follow. And administrative disciplinary actions, uh, we had a total of 16 citations and that was an increase of four from the second quarter. And we had 32 accusations that were filed uh, during the fourth quarter. And that was an increase from 25 from the second quarter. And then we also have 31 cases that were referred to the Attorney General's office and pending right now, we have 152 cases pending as of June 23rd of 2017. And we have 217 open probation uh, cases. And I don't know if anybody has uh, any questions about our charts. And, and I don't really know how to state this. I, I've seen these charts now for a number of years. And it does little to give me something real time. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do a fictitious case? Maybe of two kinds. Maybe one that's settled internally and one that goes to the AG, and just walk us through an average with this particular case, just sure. to make this yeah. real. Yes, of course, uh, we could do that, and we could do that for the next uh, board meeting. Okay. And I'll meet that request, and like I said, I'll bring different examples, and we'll, we'll track it. And okay. that everybody has a better idea like you said, instead of just seeing it on paper, to actually find out what an investigator does from the time that it lands on their desk and the process that it goes all the way through, either you know, district attorney's office or it goes to attorney general's office, yes, we will do that. And I okay. think that'll be important. Questions? So uh, agenda item number 18 is the performance uh, measures, and the performance measures is for January through March of 2017. And the uh, dental board, the enforcement uh, performance measures, we've been on target. We've been below the actual target dates. And so the only thing that, that the dates are still go over are the cases of formal uh, discipline. Those cases are still high. Uh, the target average state is 540 days, and the actual average is 1, uh, 1,553 days, and that's at the Attorney General's office. And like I said, so you know, at the board meeting that we had in San Diego, we had the Attorney General's office there speaking how they also want to improve all these numbers, and they also you know, talk about hiring more staff in order to uh, bring this down. So uh, like I said, but we continue on to be below target dates. And the only difference here that we had was uh, probation violations. Uh, we had three. Last quarter, we didn't have any, and we had three. So we, we're doing really good on that. You probably know this. What's your average probationer load per investigator? Right now, it, uh, like I said, in Southern California, it's higher than it is in Northern California. So in Southern California, I would say an average, they have, Brown, I would say either between 10 and 15. That's an average. And your investigators are also your probation monitors, right? That is correct. Yes, they're also doing the same. So they have a caseload that they're managing, and they're also monitoring the uh, probationers as well. And do you distinguish between the two? Yes, we do. So I said they have a timeline as well as because they have to report uh, same as each quarter. So they actually have that on their calendars where they meet with them 
and or they're waiting on their quarterly reports to come in through the mail. But they're in contact with them. But like I said, they all identify, they're all aware of the dates that they have to be in contact with them. So if there's no other board comments, is there any public comment on this item? So now uh, what we'll do is move into uh, agenda item number 18, and that's citation and fine program, and that will be presented by Super, uh, Supervising Investigator Ryan Blongin. I'll welcome him to the table. I think you have a PowerPoint for us. I do. Um, <laughs> unless you have eyes on the back of your head, you may want to turn your chair around. OK, good morning. Um, prepared a presentation about the citation and fine program. And the citation and fine uh, is a tool that is used uh, not for a case that needs to be sent off to the Attorney General's office for a hearing and, and formal discipline, but it's also not a case that we would simply dismiss. It's where we find that there's been a violation, but it's not a major or a uh, intentional uh, wrongdoing kind of violation. Um, so uh, the citations are prepared by investigators. The inspector can do them, and the civilian investigators also can prepare the, find, uh, the citations. Um, this is the uh, business and profession code that uh, gives us the uh, authority to issue a citation. And again, it's not formal discipline, so there won't be a hearing on it. Um, it's my understanding it doesn't appear on the website. And um, it's kind of a, a speeding ticket for a dentist kind of issue. Um, the considerations for how much the fine is going to be, um, I've been a police officer for 20 too many years now, and um, the same things that go into when you stop somebody for speeding or a traffic violation or considerations that you give for a citation on an investigation that you've done. Are they cooperative? Um, you know, were they unwittingly violating the law? Um, you know, do they have all their paperwork, of course? Uh, all, this, all the uh, licenses and permits, is everything in order in the office? Is this just an, an, an anomaly that we happen to find that day? So those are considerations that go into the fine. Um, the citation itself is a fairly formal document that is prepared by the investigator or the inspector or the civilian investigator. And the next four slides are going to show you what that is. Um, of course, the first page here just identifies the recipient and gives the statutory provision for the uh, citation. This is where we cite the causes for, for the citation, what the violations were. This one says uh, respondent basically didn't take good x-rays, uh, didn't properly evaluate, um, didn't uh, document verbal consent with the patient and uh, failed to adequately clean, shape, disinfect, and seal the entire root canal system. Now, I'd like to point out that in conjunction with our experts and our consultants that we use makes this determination possible. You certainly don't want me, a police officer and detective for my whole life, uh, ripping into x-rays and uh, making dental medical determinations by myself. So this is done in consultation with our experts and consultants to make sure that we're all in agreement on this. Um, the fine for the citation is spelled out down below there. You'll notice that there are, it's hard for you all to see, um, but there's four violations that were spelled out, four causes for the action, and you note there's four fines down below. Um, the next page, order of abatement, and, and there was some discussion earlier today about that, about what other than the fine and corrective action can we take? Does there need to be more education? Does there need to be a class that they take? Do they need to, um, the inspector all the time finds uh, violations in the office that uh, may be major, may be minor with the uh, handling of the instruments 
or putting barriers on, on the equipment, the keyboard in, in the, uh, a class in uh, ethics. And as we discussed earlier, the recipient of the citation would contact a, a vendor and give us a plan. We would go to our dental consultants and see if they like that plan and if it's within the scope and if it's reasonable. And if they approve it, we will approve it for our person to uh, go ahead and take. Um, they do have appeal rights within the citation. Um, those citation uh, appeal rights most generally are an informal conference that's done uh, with the executive officer. And it's, I've only seen it done by a conference call. Um, but that's how it is. If that's not satisfactory, they can appeal it through the legal process uh, superior court. Um, situation. Uh, the citation recovery, the fines that we get, um, the respondent has 15 days to take care of it. Um, if they don't, we can place an enforcement hold on their license and their renewal, and it could ultimately lead to formal discipline uh, by the filing of an uh, accusation. The applicable statutes are spelled here. Um, I will not read them all to you, but uh, if you look at the second one, it says, in no event shall the administrative fine assessed by the board, bureau, et cetera, exceed $5,000 for each violation or count. Um, failure to pay within 30 days of the assessment unless being appealed. I'm on the, the, the 125.9 now. Uh, if they don't pay it, a license shall not be renewed without payment. The list of regulations that uh, are spelled out here. Um, says that the executive officer can use the citation uh, against somebody who holds a permit. Uh, we would not use this against an unlicensed case because we don't have a, a, a bite into them or jurisdiction over them. Um, down below, you'll see it spells out a class A violation and a class B violation. Class A violation is obviously the more serious and um, it spells out the fine that they uh, recommend for that, not less than 1,000 and not exceeding 2,500 for each violation. Class B violations are less and they recommend a lower fine for that. For consideration today, um, where there are issues collecting the fines or we have a licensee who ignores it, doesn't take action on it, collecting is an issue. Um, Franchise Tax Board has an intercept program where if a licensee is getting a tax return they will intercept it. If they win the lottery, they'll intercept it. Um, I don't know how many dentists win the lottery, but uh, there's a mechanism in place in case they do. Um, going through collection agency is also a possibility. Um, I'm gonna touch on each of those. I've done a little more research since this PowerPoint was created. The fee charged by franchise tax, according to their documentation, averages $2 per account. So if we have a $500 outstanding citation, they average a $2 expense to us to collect that $500. I've done some research on the collection agencies and the average cost that I found was 30% of the outstanding debt. So you eat a whole bunch of that by going to the collection agency. And more good news, they average 14% success rate. So um, not only are you paying for it and then paying for it, um, you have low success rate. So uh, 16 CCR 1023.2 uh, would uh, allow the increasing the maximum fine to $5,000 per violation in accordance with the business and profession code. We have had uh, instances where we have found um, cases where specifically our inspector um, has gone out and found people who just didn't have a clue and had uh, bad uh, sterilization area, bad practices, and um, they were claimed to be unaware, but we don't see how they would. That would be an instance where the risk of infection or somebody getting sick from unclean tools were there, and that would be a circumstance where it would be applicable to do that. And this concludes the citation and fine presentation. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Two questions. Um, you had a time specific for payment of fines. Yes. And so under this, it differs from 
um, our regular enforcement where we allow people to do a payment plan, it's pay in 10 days or else? Yeah, they have to have the, the citation paid within 15 days or be appealing it within 15 okay. days. And, and the good thing about the citation is, is we don't have an extended year waiting for the Attorney General's office and court dates and defense counsel to arrange for a hearing. This is, is contracted and it's done with a lot more quickly and resolved a lot more quickly mm -hmm. and less expensively because we're not incurring the legal fees on top of it. And then the second question has to do with the possibility of a franchise tax intercept program. Yes. Um, when, when a person surrenders a license or a license is revoked. Yes. And there is there are fees associated with that particular case. Yes. There is a provision that says that you, if you ever come back, you have to pay that. If they ever try, I'm sorry. If you if you ever come back to ask to be licensed, you have to pay that. But here we're saying, if a license expires, is that going to cause us some kind of legal problem in that you're differentiating in a, a, a formal system and an informal system? Uh, the citation and fine program isn't really an informal system. It's an alternative. It's, it's not discipline. And so uh, what, our, what our process has been is that when we issue a citation, that automatic hold goes on the license. And if they don't pay the fine, their license doesn't get renewed. So we don't typically have a collection, pro uh, a collection problem with citations unless it's, uh, we had one case where we ended up revocating the, the license and he left the state. In that case, in the terms of the revocation, it says, should you ever return to California and want licensure, you'll have to pay your debt, essentially, to do that. That's actually written into the revocation, and it's typically also written into stipulated settlements. If somebody surrenders their license, we say, again, you'll, you'll have to pay off this debt. Uh, so with citations, they go by more quickly. It's sort of a warning to the dentist. We're using them more for quality of care issues at essentially what I've deemed a, perhaps a lower level. Say somebody who's been practicing for 30 years and has something happen. Perhaps our evidence isn't quite there for full discipline, but clearly something happens. In many cases, our investigators are actually talking to the licensee throughout this process and explaining what's going on. And so we're finding that they, it's a way for them to recognize something happened, yes, this isn't discipline, I'm going to pay the fine. And we keep track of that as I'm looking, if something should come up in the future, and uh, an accusation needs to be fine. We have the record it, in order to determine whether any trends were established along the way. Typically, the site and fine has been used just for records, not, not submitting records. And so if a dentist is notified by the dental board that they have 15 days, essentially, I believe, to submit the records that we're requesting, each day the board doesn't receive them. They're charged $250 a day, up to $5,000. Uh, per case. So um, we, we have had some, if you have 10 cases against somebody, that could be $50,000 pretty quick. So does franchise tax have a license hold or intercept program if someone does not pay their taxes? No. no. The only, okay. the only um, I think that's family that. support that has the opportunity to actually put a hold on somebody's license so that they can't practice. We don't have any say over that. Uh, but as far as I know, Franchise Tax Board doesn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of the, the money that um, we can't recover is because they're out of the state, so Franchise Tax Board wouldn't help. Uh, if I could just add to Ms. Burton's comment um, or question about the renewal, there's a statute in the general BNP provisions that says that the 
license shall not be renewed without payment of the renewal fee and any fines that are owed. So that's where we have the coverage that we can not renew it if they don't pay the fine associated with the citation. Um, I also want to just briefly clarify something about the appeals process. If this actually goes to an informal conference uh, and the person is not satisfied, they can request an administrative hearing. That's where it would go to next. So this would go next to an administrative law judge. Um, and then at that opportunity, if they still did not like the outcome, that is when they would file a writ in the Superior Court. So in essence, they cannot skip the step of the administrative hearing and go straight to Superior Court because they have not exhausted all of their administrative remedies, which is a requirement in order to file a writ in the Superior Court. I believe we've only had one person take it to an administrative hearing. The judge found in favor of the board, and it was a records case essentially. It's a little hard to argue if you don't submit the records. You know, there's rarely a really good excuse for not submitting records. So it, it sounds like we have a very low percentage of cases that go to any kind of appeal. Correct. Yes. No board member questions. Any public comment on this item? I, I think I have a question. Oh, sure. Ryan, before you leave. Yeah, I, I saw the word egregious, and, and, and uh, I, I guess, you know, the devil's in the details, and, and certainly you're consulting with, this, with the subject matter experts, and you're making a, determine, a determination of what is egregious and what might not be. Uh, and uh, dentistry is based so much on trust. The patient comes in, and uh, you tell them, congratulations, Mrs. Smith, you have no decay, or sometimes we have to say, sorry, Mrs. Smith, you have 10 cavities. And Mrs. Smith can sit there and go, well, I think I'm going to get a second opinion, or she can just trust the dentist. Um, I think I'm going to ask for a future conversation to, uh, because I'm seeing a, a trend in my practice where patients are coming back to me for a second opinion, and they've been told that they have uh, 10 or 11 cavities. And I, uh, I'm telling them, no, you don't. You have one small buckle pit. And uh, to me, that's egregious behavior on 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 the part of, uh, of of a dentist who's who's willing to tell someone that they have a mouthful of decay and then ostensibly do the work and and be paid for it when in fact nothing should have been touched. Uh, so I, I I'm I guess I'm not asking for your comment, but I'm gonna I'm going to ask for a future conversation so that we can have that discussion around this table because I'm seeing it and it is very very troublesome to me. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so seeing no other discussion on this item, let's move forward uh, to agenda item number 19, discussion on possible action to initiate a rulemaking to amend California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1023.2 and 1023.7 and relating to site and fine. Good morning. My name is Allison Miramontes. I am the legislative and regulatory analyst for the board. <clears throat> So, pursuant to Business and Profession Code, Section 125.9, as referenced in Ryan's presentation, the maximum fine amount for each admin administrative fine or citation is $5,000. Currently, the board has regulations under Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations within Section 1023.2 regarding administrative fines for citation and 123.7 regarding unlicensed practice. Um, relating, again, to administrative fines, which states that the maximum fine for each violation is $2,500. In order to maintain consistency, board staff has recommended we amend the maximum fine amount in California Code Regulations Sections 1023.2 and 1023.7 to $5,000. Within your materials, board staff has provided proposed regulatory language, which has been drafted for your consideration. And board staff respectfully requests that the board consider and accept the proposed regulatory language relative to citations and fines and direct staff to take all steps necessary to initiate the formal rulemaking process, including noticing the proposed language for 45-day public comment, setting the proposed language for a public hearing and authorizing 
the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package if after the close of the 45-day public comment period and public regulatory hearing, no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the proposed regulations before completing the rulemaking process and adopt the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations Title 16, 1023.2 and 1023.7 as noticed in the proposed text. Okay, any board member comments on this? Yes, Dr. Chan. So we had a prior case where um, there was a uh, question of aiding and abetting, and now we have, we would have had to refer the case or the person that was performing it to the local district attorney. Does this, does this give us the jurisdiction now to go after those? This is a separate process. Uh, this, this, no, all okay. this regulation does is essentially get our regulatory language in line with our statutory authority. So at one point we were limited to the, the fee we could charge. Okay. And we're only now raising us to equal that of our statutory authority. What you're talking about is a, is a different issue that we'll have to agendize for a future meeting. Okay. I was just going to say that I understand that size and time can only be different for a licensee. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if somebody that practiced in Burlington or Santa Rosa were to complete the rulemaking process, they would have to be different. Right. Okay, any other questions? So can I move this issue? Yes, please. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any public comment on this item? Okay, seeing no public comment, uh, could you call the roll? Um, Burton? Yes. Chan? Yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Mr. President, it passes. Thank you. Okay, moving on, agenda item number 20, another rulemaking. Uh, this one related to portable uh, and mobile dental units. Good morning. Board staff is bringing this language back before the board for consideration to initiate the rulemaking. This language was previously approved by the board mm. uh, about a year ago when board staff initiated the rulemaking. There were some clarity questions that came back from legal counsel. So in an effort to comply with those requirements, board staff made the necessary modifications to clean up the language, and essentially it's, this is the language that the board had previously approved, and so we're asking again for the board to consider and approve, accept this proposed regulatory language relative to the registration requirements for mobile and portable dental units, and direct staff to take all steps necessary to initiate the formal rulemaking process including noticing the proposed language for 45-day public comment, setting the proposed language for a public hearing, and authorize the EO to make any non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package. And to consider and possibly accept draft for application for mobile and portable dental unit permit, if after the close of the 45-day comment period the public and the public regulatory hearing, no adverse comments are received. Authorize the EO to make any non-substantive changes to the proposed regulations before completing the rulemaking process and adopt the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1049, as noticed in the proposed text. Just for clarity for some of our new board members, that's template language This essentially we read into the record that needs to be part of the regulatory file. So... Every time we initiate a rulemaking, it's ha the same language needs to be used. So this is this has been under development for quite a while, as I understand. Yes, this, this was a result of a bill that was passed in 2013 that changed the, the mobile dental clinic statutory provisions and then added the portable dental unit registration requirements. And so since it's been so long, 
Uh, board staff is recommending moving forward with the initiation of this rulemaking to get this underway. Um, I have had discussions with a couple of representatives with CDA who were the sponsors of the bill that initiated this. And they, there's some concerns regarding clarity of the provisions, but I'm confident that we can work through those during the rulemaking process. We've had pr preliminary rulemaking activities, which have included several meetings with CDA to develop this language and meeting with legal counsel. So I think we're at the point where it, it's a jumping off point. This is as good as it's gonna get for right now, and we're gonna need to continue working on it throughout the rulemaking process, which we do have time to do. Dr. Morrow. Yes, Sarah, I would just like to make sure that I understand how this interfaces with dental schools that have portable dental units that we utilize for educational purposes, clinical educational purposes, and also service to the community. These, these regulations would also be applicable to the dental school. So then under item number three, the operator definition, would that operator be the university, the school of dentistry, or does it need to be a licensed dentist? So the way that the language was crafted in, in statute eliminated the rule for the dentist to be the owner operator. And so we're having difficulty in crafting the language to correctly identify who the owner or the registrant needs to be. And so we'll all make note of that. And we'll make sure to make sure that that's clarified through the rulemaking process. But as I understand it today, it would be the school that would be the registrant as the operator for the mobile okay. dental clinic. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Lai. Uh, I just have one question. So portable dental unit, if, a, if somebody has a unit that's portable, do they still have to have a permit? Yes, this, this implements a registration requirement. The statute implemented the registration requirement. This is to clarify what those requirements will be. We can, we can always clarify that if you have questions, Dr. Uh, I think the whole purpose of the statute that went through a few years ago was specifically to address portable units because mobile clinics have been around for a long time. I know we did them when I was in school. But the suitcase type dental unit is a new thing, and relatively new. I mean, it's, it's been around for a while. So there was, anyway, there's some, there's some history there we can go over if you're interested. Okay, if there's no further uh, board member comments, I think we have public comment on this item. Maureen Titus, um, I'm a dental hygienist in alternative practice. So I'm looking at this section on exemptions. So I'm trying to understand this so I know very clearly what I can and cannot do. Number three, um, I don't know what page I'm on. Thanks. <laughs> um, so it talks about RDHAPs and other California licensed dental radiations practicing. Um, they may provide services if the service is provided as emergency treatment for their patients of record. I guess what I am trying to understand is when you say a portable dental operation, I think I need a little more clarification on what that means. I do not have a mobile unit or that I drive up and do. I take my instruments into a facility or a home to see the patients. So I'm wondering, where do I fall in here? Hmm. Do I have to register with the dental board that I'm doing this? As I understand it, any portable dental unit would need to register with the dental board. So the definition of a dental unit is me taking my instruments in a bag, in is that the definition? The definition is in statute, correct? Yes, it is in statute, right? 
1657 A2. Portable dental unit means a self-contained unit housing equipment used for providing dental treatment that is transported to and used on a temporary basis at non-dental office locations. Hmm. Okay, so that's interesting because we as RDHAPs, I don't believe, have been informed of that in the past that we have to register with the dental board. So that's why I'm trying to, I want to clear up any confusion because this is going to come up. Go ahead. Well, if I could, if, if you go read further down in sub B, it says if you routinely use a portable dental unit to provide treatment in non-dental office locations, you have to be registered with the board. So that's the statute and this is the regs to clarify what, what we re require. I think your, your question though might go a little bit more into asking for legal advice in terms of your specific situation because the proposed regs make it clear in the exemption section under sub three, if it's an emergency treatment, that's where you don't have to register. So you have to look at the, the clarifying language of what are, you, what are you doing? If it's part of your regular treatment, that's where most likely the board would say you fall under the statute and you got to register. But that's why one of the exemptions carved out is emergency. Gail Mathy, CDA. So I, yeah, there's a lot here that's potentially confusing. Some of it's coming up right now. The intention of the original legislation was actually related to, uh, we were hearing uh, of portable dental practices. So we know the mobile clinic, right? As you say, you, you drive up, you have everything in the van, you provide the services. We were hearing that portable, people were, dentists were bringing in portable units and doing a small subsection of care and then sort of going to different places and doing a small subsection of care and they weren't actually providing the entire dental, like a dental practice. So the intention of 562 was to make the requirements for a dentist that provides, dent, provides their care in a mobile situation rather than in a bricks and mortar situation and uh, clarify that those responsibilities are the same, whether you're moving around and doing it or whether you're in a bricks and mortar and doing it, here are the, thing, the rules you have to follow to provide that care. Was specifically not meant to uh, sweep in preventive programs, partial programs. There's a lot of care that is given in, not in a dental bricks and mortar, but in a mobile situation that, that's already gone on and has gone on for a long time. It was not meant to sweep that in. So some of the definitions around who, who, are, who is this applying to, what situations of dental treatment is this applying to, and what is exempted in terms of preventive programs and school-based programs and other things is some of what needs to be worked through in the definition section and in, I mean, RDHAPs aren't overseen by the board, so I think there was no intention for it to be an RDHAP uh, issue when, when we originally went forward with it. So here's some of the things that we hope to work out. Um, the, that prevention programs versus full dental care, right? Full dental treatment, the responsibility of a dentist under dental treatment. Uh, the differences between a mobile transportable facility, which has everything in it, versus the portable unit, as you say, Dr. Witcher, that you sort of pack up and take with you into a school classroom or something. A lot of differences here that would cause the wording and sections to be, need to be carefully looked at. So I'm, you know, throwing some things out here, not all of them, but there are issues to be really looked at carefully. Uh, from what I understand, though, there's been three meetings on this, and it's been worked through quite a bit. Is that, is that correct? Or? I personally had meetings with CDA and legal counsel following the enactment of the bill to develop this language. This language, staff's point right now is as developed as it can get. The way that the statute was enacted is very convoluted in that it removed the dentist owner operator provision and now it's open-ended as to who can potentially own the portable and the mobile dental units. So at this point, I strongly recommend 
moving the initiation of this rulemaking so we can get at least it published and open for 45 day public comment period and we can continue to work on these issues stakeholders would have the opportunity then to outline formally document their questions and concerns and recommend their amendments that the board would then consider at a future board meeting in response to their comments as I understand, uh, as you develop this item, you might be open to some additional discussions. <clears throat> Absolutely. Michael, I have a question. Um, if we develop the, when we develop the regulation, can we, can we have an exception if statute doesn't allow that? Correct. That's where we would clarify what um, exemptions we might want to have. So that's, that's for the, definitely we can, exploring the public comment period. Okay, so we wouldn't have to move forward with any statutory clarification? No. Okay, okay any, any further comment? Um, may I suggest a rewording at this time? Uh, no. I don't think we're quite prepared, but I do think <laughs> if you communicate that information to board staff, they will definitely look at Thank it. Thank you, I will. I, I've sent some comments of my own. <laughs> and I also want to thank you. I know a lot of work has gone into this, so I appreciate continuing to be able to work through those things. So thank you also. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't. Okay. Would somebody like to move this item? Burton and Morrow. Seconded. I'll call the row. Burton. Chan. Yes. Chappelle, yes. Foresight. Yes. King. Yes. Lai. Yes. Lay. Yes. Medina. Yes. Morrow. Yes. Stewart. Yes. Witcher. Yes. Motion passes, Mr. President. Okay. Next is agenda item 21. Initiate a rulemaking related to basic life support equivalency. And I believe we are... Uh, yes, I, I was going to ask the board to respectfully uh, table this agenda item. This language was created in response to statutory provisions that are applicable for RDA licensure. Currently, the BLS requirements for RDA licensure are restricted to just American Heart Association or American Red Cross approved providers. The intention of this rulemaking package was to open up the provider uh, abilities and, and who the approvals are. So to remain consistent with the uh, continuing education regulations, staff had recommended that we move forward with the acceptance of any PACE or SERP approved providers. Um, after the meeting materials were distributed, it was brought to our attention that there's perhaps some providers that are not captured within all of those categories. And so staff would like to um, research more the feasibility of the acceptance of potentially medical board of California approved providers as well. And so we hope to bring back language at a future meeting. I don't think we need a vote to table this, do we? Oh, we do? Okay. We do? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, Burton and Forsyth. Burton, Forsyth. <clears throat> Is there any discussion on this item? Public comment? Okay, proceed with the vote, please. Okay, I'll take the row. Burden? Yes. Chan? Yes. Chappelle, yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Motion passes. Moving on to agenda item 23, initiate a rulemaking related to implementation of additional duties of RDAEF. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, let's go back to 22. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Morrow, uh, this is your item. Uh, development and implementation of a board required uh, faculty teaching permit. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Witcher, for being willing to place this on the agenda. I think we're all aware that uh, the Dental Practice Act requires that to practice dentistry in the state of California, you must have either a license or a special permit issued from the dental board. However, there are exceptions to that requirement. Uh, and one of those exceptions is, and naturally, 
is dental students that are registered as students in dental schools in California are obviously practicing dentistry and they are unlicensed, so that's an exception. Currently, there is also an exception, and that is <clears throat> that the practice of dentistry by licensed dentists of other states or other countries while appearing and operating as bona fide clinicians or instructors in dental colleges approved by the Dental Board of California. Now, that actually says other states or countries. So from, from an operational standpoint, that means that dental schools in California can employ dentists that are not licensed in the state of California as long as they are licensed in another state or another country. That does not require a special permit. A special permit is to a dentist faculty member who is licensed in another state or another country with some very uh, stringent restrictions. Number one, that must be a full-time faculty member, not just a part-time. And it also, their practice is limited to, in a practice in addition to the requirements of their academic responsibilities and their clinical supervision responsibilities, to be involved in the institution's faculty practice process. And that is limited to one day per week or 52 days out of the year. So therefore, uh, we have a number of faculty positions in dental schools in California that are filled by dentists who are licensed, but licensed in another state or another country that do not have a permit to provide patient care in that institution's faculty practice. Therefore, we have dentists that are practicing dentistry in the state of California that we don't even know who they are or how mm -hmm. many there are. Because these are dentists that have a license, could be in another country, as I said, but they're not registered with a special permit. My issue of this is that these individuals, by statute, are practicing dentistry because the limitation or the exemption says the practice of dentistry by licensed dentists of other states or countries while appearing as faculty members. There are a number of state boards that have what is referred to as a faculty or a teaching permit. This fits that that area of exemption for an individual who is a faculty, has a faculty appointment, but has a license in another country or state, but is not registered as a special permit. Uh, my concern, again, is that we have a number of, an unknown number of dentists who are practicing dentistry as faculty members that we do not know about. We don't know what their backgrounds are, we don't know what it takes to renew their license. Uh, they probably have not taken the California Law and Ethics exam or are not required to take the CE course in Law and Ethics in order to renew their license because we don't even know who they are or where they are. So my recommendation at this point is that I think this is an important issue for us to uh, get an understanding of. I don't think it's anything that we would, that we should discuss in, in open, you know, full board. My suggestion to the president would be to refer this issue to the licensure certification and permits committee for some committee work, which the, could then be reported back to the board with some information and uh, some recommendations. As an example, I said I don't know for sure how many of these dentists that are faculty members in the schools. I, knew, I do know how many are in one of the six dental schools in California. And if I took that measure as being that number, as being typical for a dental school in the state, I would have to say that we have in the area of 250 of those individuals. Now, some of these individuals have licenses in foreign countries, not in the United States, which is permissible by statute. Some licenses in foreign countries are a license for life with no continuing education required whatsoever. And I think this is something that we need to address. 
Okay, any questions from board members? <clears throat> well, actually, I have a question. So do you, do you know if all the dental schools in California have a credentialing and privileging process for all of the faculty, whether or not they're licensed to practice in California? No, I do not know that. Do you? Well, do you work at the dental school? I was hoping you would know. I don't know that every, <laughs> I don't know that every dental school has. I only know what my school has. Okay. As I said, yeah. I don't know for sure how many of these dentists that are practicing dentistry as faculty members that exist okay. in the state. The only way we can find that out is to uh, do some business. And, and again, I don't think this is the, I can certainly will yeah. answer your questions, but I don't think uh -huh. this is the place to do that business yeah. right now, the time or the place to do that. So business. is that part of the coder process though, that they okay. have the credentials? Obviously the, the schools, for a faculty member to be qualified to teach in a dental school by coda is not necessarily required by the state. Right. Right. Okay, so yeah. to be to teach in a dental school by code of standards, you have to be a dentist. You have to have graduated with a DDS, a DMD, or right. equivalent degree. Yeah. That meets code of standards. Now, when they come and do a site visit, they want to see those credentials. They want to see that they are meeting CODA's credentials. Are, are CODA's credentials the same as ours? We, we have to decide what we want mm -hmm. to do to protect yeah. our public. Now, you understand that when students are licensed, unlicensed providers and they're treating patients in a school of dentistry clinic, the, the dentist that is responsible for that treatment is the supervising licensed dentist. Correct. And maybe it might be a surprise to you, but we do have cases that go south, treatments that go south, patients that are unhappy, they contact attorneys, and they institute uh, legal action. The individual that is responsible for that patient's treatment was not the student. It is the faculty the member on school. record who supervised that student's care. Mm -hmm. So here we are. If this was a dentist who had a license in a foreign country, we didn't even know they existed. They weren't up to speed on California's law and ethics. Would you be comfortable with that? I mean, these are just, you know, things that we well, need guess, to be aware of. Okay, well, I guess, okay, so I'm putting back on the school. Does the school feel comfortable okay. with that faculty? Uh, I will use, I will, I, will, I will answer that by this, <laughs> okay? Uh, assuming that somebody else is managing your risk is mm -hmm. poor risk management. Mm -hmm. So for me to assume that somebody else is doing what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Shame on me. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to ask, I mean, I'm asking the question just so that I understand what's going on internally at any of the dental schools in California, right. you know, and because if all the schools have very good credentialing and privileging process, then that would help the staff, let's say that the staff contacts the dental school and asks for a list of faculty at the school, will the school be able to provide all the credentialing and preaching processes of all the faculty members, not just those that are not licensed in California? I mean, because that's, that's what I'm trying to find out, would, whether or not you, there's the search of process. I would, I would hope so, but the only way we could find out is to ask. And, yeah. And again, that, that's where the committee would come in and maybe even a subcommittee of the full committee to gather that information to bring it back because I don't know. It's just an area that I feel needs to be tightened up. Mm -hmm. and, and that's no, the purpose of I, this yeah. presentation for Dr. Morrow to bring an issue before the board mm -hmm. and the board to determine um, based on his request whether or not to move forward and right. essentially direct staff to start to do the research on this, this issue. Has Dr. Morrow given you enough information to say, gee, we better look into this? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that you feel doesn't need to be reviewed? Um, at, at this point, uh, what, what we're trying to do, of course, is, is manage workload. And so we didn't want to, typically what we would do if we had an issue is board staff would 
try to bring all the information to you right now. Um, but we thought, well, we're going to just check to see whether this is an issue the board would be interested in. I see people nodding the heads that it's likely that you would be interested in that, and that's what we need to know. Or if you're not interested, that's what we need to know. Do you agree with, do you agree with that, Dr. Morrill? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I know that this is an issue. I believe the first time we heard this was your first year on the board. Um, and I maintained at that time that the onus, is, the onus is just the opposite. That if you are saying that there is a problem, then it's not up to board staff to establish that there is. Um, and I don't know how you would go about it. I mean, I understand that that you say that this is an issue at your school, but I'm not convinced that it's a universal issue. Well, what I'm saying that exists in, in you might say, my school, or at one school anyway, I'm sure exists in other schools, and that is that there are dentists that are serving as faculty members in our schools of dentistry and, and practicing dentistry as such that are not licensed in California, number one. And number two, we don't even know that they're there and we don't know who they are because the schools at this point in time are not required to let us know or to register those individuals. So this is an information uh, a point of information for the members of the board to know that this exists. Now, what their credentialing process is, what their uh, verification of these individuals, I don't really know. That's up to the School of Dentistry. But I will say that they are probably meeting CODA's requirements or they would be uh, have a, a reporting requirement for CODA. Uh, so I know I have a number of friends and colleagues that are faculty members in other schools in California, other dental schools in California other than myself. And I know that they do employ faculty members that are not licensed in California. And it is not a requirement for a, a faculty member in a dental school to be licensed in California. Judy. I think it's worthy of a conversation with the LCP committee. LCP? Uh, do you have something? Okay. Yes. So moved. Well, that it just what Judith said. It should go to the committee for further analysis. <clears throat> the action item is to uh, direct staff to further research the topic. So we don't need a motion. Well, on I, that. I, I think it's quite important that we need to do a little we, we need to do a little background research and approach it as Karen suggested, and then if, if need be, we can bring it to committee if that's what the board wants. So we have a motion. I thought you said we didn't need a motion, so I'm not. Do we need a motion? We don't need the motion now to bring it to committee. Yes. I, I would I have a comment I'd like to make, and I'd, I'd like Dr. Lay to respond. Um, usually the universities have a pretty stringent re, uh, credential review. Uh, when I applied and was granted faculty privileges at UOP, uh, it was, I think, slightly more in depth than to get hospital privileges, including primary source verification of all my training. Uh, and they were really, they weren't going to let me touch a patient until I had done that. I can't imagine the state institutions would be any less stringent. Now, it is true that um, we do not know, we don't have a requirement for reporting if there are lawsuits and things like that against schools or, or patients that patients bring. And it does happen. Um, as you can imagine, lots of things happen in dental schools. It's a learning area. Patient expectations, I think, often recognize that. But uh, it isn't like there aren't protections in place. I, I think that there are. They may not be ours, but 
the dental school is sort of, I don't know, sacred ground, you know, where learning can occur and, you know, it's granted certain exemptions because of that. Now, maybe that we're not, not everyone is comfortable with that, but I'm just saying my experience and I don't know, Dr. Chan, you had something. So in contrast, I was in a uh, GPR program whose um, director had not passed the dental board over four times, and yet he was directing a GPR program. And it was under the umbrella of a, it was the Charles Drew Postgraduate School under the umbrella of UCLA, so it can happen. I, I, think, I think what we're talking about here is limited to pre, pre-doctoral, I mean, to uh, dental school undergrads, you know. And I think what happens in postgraduate programs is very different a lot of times. But the umbrella is with the school. So that's where the connection is. Oh, fair enough. And I, I do agree with Dr. Morrow that there are some faculty members at dental schools that may not be licensed you know, in California, because I'm aware of a few at one of the dental schools. But I, I, I do think that, you know, further research needs to be done and hopefully maybe the staff could, you know, could um, do some of the research, you know, further into this topic to see if there's a, if, there's a, if you can get a sense, you know, of, of what the schools are doing when they recruit, you know, the faculty members. Um, I think, I think, Kathleen already made the motion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I, you're I would second. second. I would okay. second that motion. Yes. So we have a motion and a second. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? <laughs> you said we didn't make. You said we didn't make any motion. Wait. Okay. Call for a vote. And just. Just one more comment before, before we take the vote. Yes, yes, friend. My issue is not whether there is or there isn't. I just think that if you're going to bring a proposal, that you don't bring a proposal and say, you do the work. Particularly when we look at what we have had here, just in this packet, in regulations and uh, the process and how old some of them, how old the statutes are in some case, and to say to board staff, take on all of this work. I just think that there is an onus to bring something and not just say, you prove this or disprove it. I just have an issue with that. Well, I think one of the reasons for bringing it here was to raise that question, is this how we want to direct our resources when we have all these other things going on? And, you know, I think Dr. Morrow has made a reasonably compelling case. Um, it's up to the board to decide, you know, considering all the other things that we have on the plate, whether we want to add this as well. Question. Um, well, two questions. I really did like Kathleen's idea of it coming to LCP before I'm real protective of staff load because my board puts a lot more on me than I, than I can take. So I'm really protective of that. And if it goes to LCP, then we can determine if we can move forward um, on this. But my question is, if we do know, what do we do with that information? What, why, if, and I understand knowing, but once we get the information, what do we do with it? Okay. Uh, if I can respond to that. Once we get the information, what we do with it is, do we decide that that information is sufficient to satisfy us that controls are in place, or do we need to then uh, move forward in making some uh, regulatory or statutory changes to get control. Okay. Uh, you know, the limited research that I've done in this area, our neighboring states of Nevada, Washington, and Oregon both have faculty uh, or teaching permits required. 
and for their dental for their faculty in their state's dental schools to be registered with the dental board and they must that is either an annual or a biannual renewal and they must meet the same education continuing education requirements as is required for licensees in that state and their justification or their rationale for that is that they are practicing dentistry in their state. So therefore, they need to be up to date on the continuing education requirements as any other practicing dentist in their state. Now, that's, that's our three neighboring states. A couple of states on the, on the, on the right coast, uh, Florida and New York, they also have the same type of a permit requirement and with the same renewal requirements of that permit, meeting the same requirements for renewal of a license by licensees of that state. So those are some examples of my limited research on it. I'd like to comment that just because we refer it to committee, uh, I don't think that's going to change the amount of staff work that's required. Because I know if I call up dental schools and start asking a bunch of questions, they're not going to want to talk to me. <laughs> Okay. Well, staff will certainly be utilizing um, members of the LCP committee to assist in the research that we're going to be doing. And Dr. Morrow, I believe, is on the LCP committee. So uh, what I envision happening is gathering more data. And at the president's discretion, he would assign it to see whether or not it would be full board or go to the LCP committee. Um, so this was just brought forward, as I said, to to see whether there was enough interest among yeah. other board members to at least do some initial research into the issue, and we would be involving the mm -hmm. committee members moving forward. Okay. And can I just add to that? I, I didn't go to dental school, but I went regular school, and I'd be very upset if a teacher was teaching myself or my children that hadn't been through the courses that they're supposed to be teaching. And we don't know for sure if they're coming from another state or another country, you've said. We don't know whether they've been through those courses, correct? I mean. Uh, at, the, at the university level or at the dental school level, we are requiring transcripts from their education. That's part of the vetting purpose. And I'm not saying that the schools are not vetting them, but which is saying we don't. Is know. that enough for us? Okay. Yeah. Is it? Is it? And these are questions that that we need to answer. I think. And that is, is that okay with us? Is that sufficient with us to say we're reliable or the school to do the proper vetting process that the faculty members that are are teaching there without a California license were comfortable with them? Okay. And and it's it's a concern that I have as being in the educational community and knowing that this happens and knowing that's an exemption. And I just think you need you all need to be aware that that's happening out there. Now, what you want to do with it is again up okay. up to us collectively, not up to me. Okay. And and because what uh, Dr. Morrow has said that some of these faculty members may not have continuing education requirements from the city, from the state mm -hmm. or the country from which they're licensed, you know, our California licensees have to make sure have to have fifty units every two years, and part of those units need to be Dental Practice Act, Infection Control, and Ethics. So these faculty members are, are not um, required to at least meet those three. OK. Um, I've been asked to take public comment on this item. Is there any? OK, seeing none. Would you call the roll, please? Yes. Burden? Yes. Chan? Yes. Chappelle Ingram? Yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? No. Mr. President, it passes. Okay, moving along, item number 23. Uh, another rulemaking related to implementation of additional duties of RDAEFs. Sarah. 
In 2014, Assembly Bill 1174 added specific duties for RDAEFs uh, relative to the determination of radiographs and the placement of interim therapeutic restorations. This was in response to the Health Workforce Pilot Project number 172. It also put in place a, a unique uh, regulatory rulemaking process where the board and the Dental Hygiene Committee need to promulgate regulations at the same time. The bill also implemented the same duties for several of their licensing categories. So board staff has drafted the, this rulemaking documentation. We have draft language and a draft form. This exact language was presented to the board at the December board meeting, and we asked for any feedback or comments from stakeholders or board members. We did not receive any feedback after that meeting, and so at this point, staff is recommending that the board initiate the rulemaking. Um, I have been in discussions with Anthony Lum, who's the interim EO for the DHCC, and there are still some areas that we're going to need to continue to tweak that I'm confident that we're going to be able to do during the 45-day comment period and bring back to the board for uh, modified text. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Board member discussion on this item. This one's been around a couple of times. We've looked at it before. It looks pretty good to me. Okay, Burton and Forsyth. Is there public comment on this item? Anthony Lund, Interim Executive Officer, Dental Hygiene Committee. Um, the only thing that I wanted to say, uh, in addition, I look forward to working with Sarah on this regulation package. And there was one request that the committee has to add into it, and we'll, we'll address it with staff. But it's in regards to um, while we're going through this lovely new regulatory process and how long it takes to get a regulation in place, if we could include um, a provision in there because the dental board approves all of our continuing education um, providers, if we could include a section regarding CE providers in that regulation, because I've, I've received a lot of requests from uh, faculty who have been trained in the ITR process to now they want to kind of expand and provide CE hours to other individuals who are outside of their school. So that was one um, aspect that my committee asked to, re to request uh, the board. Okay, so noted. Uh, if you're gonna work with staff, I think we can take a look at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> any other public comment? Okay. If you would go ahead there. I need a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we had a motion. A second. We had uh, Burton. Burton and Forsyth. <laughs> okay. Uh, Burton. Jan. Yes. Chappelle Ingram, yes. Forsyth. Yes. King. Yes. Lai. Yes. Lay. Yes. Medina. Yes. Morrow. Yes. Stewart. Witcher. Yes. It passes. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to move into our committee reports. Uh, first, we'll start off with uh, licensure certification and permit committee report on closed session. Dr. Lai, before you start your report, if I may remind board members, all board members received the closed packet. So you have the LCP information in your packet, even though you weren't on the committee. So staff will be separately collecting those packets before you leave today. So make sure you turn those in. OK, good afternoon. So. Yesterday, the, we had a closed session um, meeting on considering seven applications for issuance of a new license to replace a canceled license. Um, I want to thank the staff for putting together all these booklets because it, the, we, we did our homework. It's, it's, it was quite a, a, a large packet that we received. Oh, yeah. We spent at least two weeks on on it, and I think uh, the meeting went very well, and it went very quickly because everybody did their homework. But uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Witcher for uh, helping me out on a few cases. 
and um, a lot of insight from Dr. Morrill. So um, we considered the, the first application uh, we considered was Dentist JF for issuance of a new license to replace a canceled license and um, everything was in order. All document, documentation checked out and we would like to approve the issuance of, a, of his license uh, on the condition he passes California Law and Ethics. Okay, I'm going to move on. So let, let's get back to, to, you know, just uh, this morning when before the meeting, I was thinking to myself, law and ethics, law and ethics. So, and how important this, this committee is, is <clears throat> we have to make sure our dentists and applicants um, follow the law and ethically do their job. So I think it's really, it sounds real easy to pass law and ethics as, as a requirement, but I think um, there's more to that when, when I say that, so. Um, That's just uh, addition to uh, what I want to say. Um, application number two, dentist MG. Same issue. Uh, all the documentation was in order. We want to approve uh, the issuance on the condition of successfully passing California law and ethics. Number three. Dentist TH, uh, he was out of the country, so, but he did uh, do his training here. He was in Canada and um, he wants to move back to California to be with his family. The recommendation is one, verification that he was actively practicing in Canada and, su and successfully taking law and ethics uh, in California. Um, staff was instructed to make sure we do have verification because there's no way for us to verify that. Fourth application, dentist E. Ott. Um, this is our second time before our, our committee. And the last uh, time she was to um, complete law and ethics and, uh, and also um, retake the rep because it had been a long time. Um, new information was given to us and uh, again, the committee decided that rep would still be in order. She would still have to take rep and again, pass law and ethics. Okay, dentist TS. Um, Patient, I mean, the uh, dentist hasn't been practicing for a while. Uh, again, the committee uh, considered all the options and felt that uh, REB was in order and the completion of and successful uh, examination of the law and ethics. Uh, number six. So we did TS, AK. Oh. You're getting me out of order, I think. You're getting confusing me. This is only my second time at this. It's real, I'm a little nervous here, all right? Um, number six, um, registered dental assistant CL. Uh, all things were, again, in order. Uh, board committee, uh, uh, I want the board to uh, approve uh, issuance of a new license uh, if she successfully passes uh, RDA raw, uh, written law and ethics. Number seven, 
RDASL, issuance of a new license to replace a canceled license was considered. Uh, everything was in order and uh, with the successful passing of law, uh, written law and ethics. Okay, and I want to defer to Dr. Witcher to, to um, explain the, there were two, one was a conscious sedation permit that we um, discussed, and another one was a general anesthesia permit that was discussed, and uh, if you can help me out there. Sure, you. just procedurally the way this works is um, general anesthesia and conscious sedation permit holders have to undergo an office evaluation and inspection every five or six years. Um, two evaluators uh, are impaneled by the board to go out and conduct these evaluations. Uh, the process is handled by board staff in terms of the scheduling. Uh, the examine the evaluation is scheduled on a is uh, graded on a pa pass fail basis and includes a number of sections, including uh, performance of uh, thirteen simulated emergencies uh, in conjunction with uh, the, both the dentist and their staff. Um, you know, in the event of a failure of a initial evaluation. Um, the uh, second evaluation can be scheduled and taken within 30 days. Uh, if a second evaluation is uh, granted a failure, a failing grade, then uh, it comes back to the board for a decision as to whether to grant a third evaluation or deny the permit. Uh, typically, uh, you know, every, every case is a little different. We do this on a case-by-case -case basis. We looked at the look at all the reports uh, that are provided by the evaluators, and a staff recommendation always goes out uh, to the candidate regarding their findings and in, in detail. So uh, that's that's the process. So in the case of um, dentist A K. Um, failed the, uh, he failed it twice. And so the staff is, the committee is recommending uh, to deny uh, a new permit. And um, because of the failure, uh, and it, we did not feel that it warranted a third examination if uh, he, um, failed it twice. Now, committee uh, number nine committee reviewed general anesthesia permit uh, dentist WJ. Again, the uh, situation was they failed or he failed the, uh, he failed it twice. And so we did not feel that a f it warranted a third um, try and uh, just to deny his his permit. So that's my report. Thank you. Um, so now we need uh, a motion to approve. I'll motion. <coughs> Second. Any further discussion on these on this item? Written law ethics. We didn't assign written to anybody. It was just law and ethics.
If you'll hold on, staff's checking. SL. Only law and ethics. Thank you. Okay, is there any, any further discussion? Got that straight. Okay, taking the row. Um, Burden, Chan? Yes. Chappelle Ingram, yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Medina? Yes. Mara? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Mr. President, it passes. Okay, thank you. Let's move on with our next item, uh, Substance Abuse Awareness Committee report. All right, thank you. Yesterday we had our Substance Use Awareness Committee meeting. Uh, we called the meeting to order, a quorum was established. We approved the May 11, two th 2017 committee uh, meeting minutes. We had a report on the diversion program from our Chief Enforcement Officer, Car um, Carlos Alvarez. We had an update regarding uh, the implementation of SB 482 re uh, relating to controlled substance utilization review and the evaluation system, CURES 2.0. There was an update regarding uh, the registration and usage statistics. We had an update regarding the June 28th statewide prescription opioid misuse and overdose prevention work, working group meeting. And finally, for, um, for discussion and, uh, and possible action on the mission statement pertaining to raising the awareness in the California dental profession of opioid use and abuse among patients. And I'm uh, certainly hopeful today uh, that uh, the board will be supportive of and approve that draft mission statement so that we may uh, move forward and continue to working to uh, then uh, uh, add references to our website, help educate both professional community, our professional community, and the public we serve. So moving forward, um, we will continue to work with staff looking for ways to improve and raise awareness of this crisis before us. And uh, before we get to that motion, I'd like to take the time to thank the subcommittee and our staff for all their help in this matter. So thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to um, move the uh, mission statement. I think we have that. Is there any? Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any public comment? Substance Abuse Awareness Committee, okay. Why don't you go ahead and call the roll. Okay, Burton? Chan? Yes. Chappelle Ingram, yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Mara? Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. It passes, Mr. President. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, anesthesia committee. Oh, I'm sorry, ledge reg committee. The legislative and regulatory committee meeting met and uh, established a quorum. The minutes from May 11, 2017 were approved. Um, on the, the next item was the legislative calendar. Um, with two notations that the legislature is on re summer recess until August 21st and the interim study recess period is begins on September 15th. Um, the next item was to um, review several items of legislation and we took no additional position on AB 40, the next item was AB 1710. Um, we did not take a position, we did not take a, 
position beyond our previous watch position. The next item was AB 17, seven, I'm sorry, 1277. Um, that bill is, um, is by Assemblyman Daly. We understand that CDA is working with the author's office on some additional um, amendments on that. We kept our watch position. Next item, SB 641, and this is the Cures Bill um, for which we had a watch position. We kept that position. SB 762, Hernandez. Um, that bill... Um, It doesn't have any further hearings scheduled. We had a watch position. We will keep that position. And then the next item was update on um, pending regulatory practices. Uh, packages, I'm sorry. The first was continuing education requirements and basic life support equivalency standards. The board will bring information to our August meeting on that item. And we did hear that, we did hear that, and that was, wasn't that the one we decided to hold? Okay. Um, the next item was defining discovery and filing for CCR Title 16. The final approval of that um, has happened and those regulations became effective on July 1. The next item was dental assisting the comprehensive regulatory packet. That's a work in progress. Item D, Interim Therapeutic restore, rest, Restoration Competency Standards for Instructions. These are new regulations, and um, that language was presented to us at this meeting. Next item, Elected Facial Cosmetic Surgery Permit Application. The, the board is currently working on that issue. And then the next issue was um, fee increase, according to California Code of Regulation 16, Section 1021 and 1022. That is going through the process, and, and the board anticipates that the Office of Administrative Law will approve that sometime in August. Next, Institutional Standards, California Code of Re Regulations, Title 16, Section 1024. The board is currently working on that file. Next is Licensure by Credential. Board is also working on that. The next one is the Mobile Dental and Portable Unit Registration Requirements, and that was an issue we discussed at this board meeting. That was all the items before the committee. Are there any questions or concerns? Move for appro approval. So in the absence of the secretary for expediency, I'm happy to call the roll. I got it. Okay. Burton? Yes. Chan? Yes. Chappell Ingram? Yes. Forsyth? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? The motion has passed. Thank you. Moving on, next item number 27, Anesthesia Committee Report. Dr. Morrow. Thank you. Uh, the Anesthesia Committee met, a roll call was taken, and a quorum was established. 
uh, the minutes for the anesthesia meeting, uh, committee meeting of May 11, 2017 were approved. The general anesthesia and conscious sedation evaluation statistics were reviewed, uh, and the, uh, the results of those are in your packet, but just briefly, from July 16 to July 17, the pass rate for the uh, conscious sedation and evaluation of examinations were 98 uh, percent, a good, good pass rate. Uh, agenda item number four was the information and discussion regarding Assembly Bill 224, Assembly, Senate Bill 392, and Senate Bill 501. This dis information and discussion was provided by the Vice Chair of the Anesthesia Committee, uh, Fran Burton. Fran, do you have anything that you want to share with us regarding your uh, information and discussion on those three bills? Oh, okay. I, I, I would like to I would like at this point to publicly thank staff for moving so quickly to move the bill that we needed for dental assisting on the exam. That was such a wonderfully smooth process. And um, I, I, I can attest to the fact that bills don't often move that fast. And so I would like to publicly thank the executive officer and the assistant executive officer for your expedient work on this. Okay, thank you. I, I accept that, but I also want to say that we worked very well with a number of people to get this through. Uh, we pulled out all the stops, the department, agency, um, of course, uh, Assembly BMP Committee, uh, Chief of Staff, Leandra, um, was very helpful in this. And so I'm very grateful that we were able to get this done. <clears throat> there was no public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, there was, there were not any uh, stakeholders, uh, possible considerations for future meetings, uh, or from the committee members themselves. Uh, that completes my report for the anesthesia committee. Thank you. Uh, could I have a motion to approve? Second. Okay, Burton and Chan. Uh, any board member discussion? Public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gary Cooper representing uh, Cal Amos, California Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. As we discussed yesterday, and we were very grateful for the fact that you were very attentive to discussing uh, SB 501, which is the current uh, bill that's out there dealing with the pediatric anesthesia. And I'm very grateful for your position of watch to continue to watch this. And I certainly do not mean to try to undermine the chair and the vice chair's uh, opinion. What I would like to do and what I am requesting, if it's possible, is for some acknowledge, official acknowledgment from this board that this particular piece of legislation is moving in the direction that this board had requested the legislature to move in dealing with pediatric anesthesia, specifically as it relates to doing a study as to how it would affect access to care, particularly as it relates to dealing with the permitting process, particularly as it relates to the staffing and the education and the training of the staff. Uh, so while you have not seen the current amendments that are going to be in print within the next few days, I guess what I'm asking specifically from this board is to give us some sort of an acknowledgement that this bill is moving in the right direction, that you certainly reserve the right to oppose it or change your position. But at this point, I'd like to see that this board would acknowledge that this particular piece of legislation is moving in the direction that you had requested when you did your report uh, back in December. With me is Dr. Larry Moore who is the Vice President of Cal Amos and former President of the National Association, who was very involved in the drafting of this current bill. 
and is very specifically knowledgeable on the amendments and on the specific language in the bill. And if we may indulge you for just a minute or two to try to come up with some of the, uh, discuss some of the uh, ideas that are in the amendments, so you'll get a better understanding. And again, all I'm asking is that there should be some official acknowledgement that this bill is moving in the direction that you had asked the legislature to move when you did your report. So with that, with the, with the chair's indulgence, I'd ask Dr. Moore to be able to address the uh, board. Please. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Calimus has worked uh, carefully and collaboratively with CDA and, and uh, with pediatric dentistry in order to address uh, some of the issues in 501 that may also have been of concern to the dental board. The, um, the dental board analysis um, was, uh, was carefully uh, drafted and I, I reviewed that and I'd like to just to a little bit about what the amendments will mean to the concerns that the dental board raised in its analysis of 501. So if I may, the, in, in the amended version, the new permits uh, will be effective in 2021, which gives uh, more time for the communities of interest and the stakeholders to adapt to the changes. It also uh, uh, allows for rolling implementation, uh, which would accommodate the existing permit holders. The existing permits would not change until they expire, uh, and the, the new requirements would only apply to newly issued permits. So it wouldn't flood the dental board with uh, uh, permits suddenly at the time of the change. Uh, for the report on access to care, the amended uh, 501 will uh, require the Office of Oral Health uh, at the Department of Public Health of California uh, to conduct a study on access to care as a neutral third party rather than the Dental Board of California. And, uh, and this will move, and the uh, completion date will be moved from 2019 to 2020, which allows for contracting uh, and completion of the report. And I'm so sorry, I always turn my phone off, except for when I'm speaking, and it goes off. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, um, redundant uh, reporting requirements were removed from Section 1616.1, and, um, and this report the, on uh, sedation safety will happen at Sunset Review in 2019. Um, we, uh, the amendments will clarify that the personnel uh, training, the training of personnel needed for deep sedation in children under seven uh, will require the treating dentist and one other person who will be the dedicated monitor or anesthesia provider both have advanced uh, training in pediatric life support and airway management. Uh, the amended version creates pathways through direct supervision for dentists and anesthesiologists to get the experience necessary to get a pediatric endorsement uh, for uh, those who wish to treat children under seven who may lack the sufficient number of cases to prove competency. This is a, is a, a nod to uh, issues in access to care. Um, the, um, through, through our uh, discussions with pediatric dentistry, uh, we, the amended uh, 501 will remove the limitation that minimal sedation be a single dose of a single drug. And rather, um, the, uh, ap the administration of drugs will be consistent with the definitions for both general anesthesia, deep sedation, and moderate sedation, where the route of administration uh, and the drugs given are not the issue, but the level of sedation obtained is, uh, is the requirement. So. Um, for minimal sedation, dentists will be required to maintain minimal sedation, but they won't be restricted to one drug and one dose. Um, it also allows for uh, other pathways. There was an unintended uh, catch-22 in, in 501 where you had to compete, uh, complete a pediatric dental residency in order to uh, um, qualify for a minimal sedation permit. That, that's fixed in the amended version so that um, uh, that can be accomplished through 24 hours of training and an, uh, a requisite number of cases, uh, successful cases of minimal sedation. Um, the requirements for capnography have been uh, refined. Uh, 
so that uh, in all general anesthesia and deep sedation cases, capnography is mandated. Um, the version that you all saw allows for the use of two out of three methods, and one of those methods is direct verbal communication with the patient. You can't do that in deep sedation and general anesthesia, so that's, that's been clarified. Um, also, dentists with a moderate or minimal sedation pediatric permit um, have to have the skills, equipment, and drugs necessary to rescue a patient from a deeper unintended level of sedation. And then uh, finally, the codes uh, in, I believe it's 1637.9 regarding physicians have been aligned better with the codes in 1637.1, which uh, are general anesthesia deep sedation permits for dentists. And so those requirements are virtually identical now for both groups. And then I would say, I, want, I would thank the dental board for its work in this and for its recommendations. And I um, uh, encourage you to look at 501 as the only vehicle through which prompt, timely enhancements in pediatric anesthesia safety can be obtained at this point. We're looking four years down the line. Calamus really doesn't have anything to lose now, but, but our underlying uh, motive throughout this process has been to ensure that safe, effective anesthesia with access to care on all levels, all socioeconomic levels is maintained. And we believe 501 will be a great step in that direction while at the same time moving forward the study, which will show us if we need greater enhancements to anesthesia safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Burton. I indicated to um, the legislative committee uh, yesterday reasons why we should continue a watch position because we've not seen these. And um, you've just presented a page full of amendments that we still haven't seen. And so even an acknowledgement in moving in the right direction would assume that we think all of these things that you just discussed means that we're moving in the right direction. And absent being able to see that, I am not willing to do that. What I am willing to do is I, I think that we have some flexibility is to work with the executive officer and the president when we see these to determine what, if anything, we can do. But to say at this point um, that I am personally willing to give some acknowledgement, I am not. But I am willing to do that other part once once we see that, and I and I do think that we had decided a couple of years ago that because of the nature of legislation, that the ledge chair, the president, and the executive officer had some flexibility outside of the full board. Thank you. Uh, any additional comments from board members? Uh, any additional public comment on this item? <laughs> our, ah, Dr. Ricciardo is coming up. Did you? I'm, I'll I, let you. I just, I just like yeah. to say that that I, I understand completely what you're saying, and I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't buy a, you know, a car if I couldn't test drive it. We're, we're, we're hoping that you'll you'll and like the amendments when you see them. And Paul Ruggiardo, I'm representing the California Society of Pediatric Dentistry. Uh, I've heard a number of comments here about pediatric dentistry, and I will wanted to just provide the clarification that we will be supporting 510 as brought forward. We've worked with the author's office. We've worked with the sponsors to address our concerns regarding light and moderate sedation, and we are comfortable with 501 as it will be amended, and we will be supporting that bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Okay, if there's no additional public comment, uh, could we have a, a move to approve? Yes. Ooh. I'm sorry. Yes, okay. it was. Burton we're, and Jan. Okay, we're ready to vote. Okay. Burton? We report, yes. Appro accept the report. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. Jan? Yes. Chappelle and Groom, yes. Foresight? Yes. King? Yes. Lai? Yes. Lay? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Mr. President, it passes. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. Our next item is for public comment on items not on the agenda. Any public comment on anything? Okay. Uh, board member comments for items not on the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Tom. Yeah, through the chair and our executive officer, I would like, uh, the, uh, if you would entertain a future agenda item, I'd, I'd like to have a conversation relating to over-treatment, over-prescribing, uh, and um, a trend that I'm seeing, and I'd appreciate that consideration. Thank you. So noted. Ms. King. <clears throat> um, I would like to have a discussion at the board about the committee meetings that occur during the board meetings. My first year, we didn't have that, and I find it's, it's not a useful way for me to use my time to sit in the back during a committee meeting and then hear it again here, rather than doing it all together like we did when Hong was chair. I just, I just think, and, and up till now, I appreciate that Michael let the public speak again, because previously we wouldn't let them speak again if they spoke in the committee meeting, which I always thought was wrong. The public should be allowed to speak anytime they want. So I definitely would like that discussion. Yeah, we've, we've gone back and forth with different ways of doing this, and so we can, we can always look at that again. Thank you. We'll be going into a new year, and I think it's a good discussion topic. Okay. So if there's no other items, I guess this concludes our business today, and we can adjourn. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <clears throat>